ants that are actually living inside it. Maybe they're eating all the bits of grass that haven't been digested. Or they could just be living inside. So I'd better probably put their, their home back together. I didn't know there were going to be any ants in there. How cool is that though? So now we need to go this way. Now, Bina, you've asked if the animals ever notice us. Of course they do. 100% they notice us, especially when we're out on foot. We do have to be very, very careful because the animals don't like us as much as they do when we're in the car. See, these animals have seen, uh, well, been interacting, so been experiencing people for a long, long time, but not necessarily like what we're doing now on foot. They see us as a predator, so they see us as a threat. But in the cars, we are no threat to them at all. So we're kind of like a neutral, we're like a tree or a rock or something like that. They just sort of ignore us these days. So then they're fine. But when they see us on foot, sometimes they're not too happy. So the idea of a bushwalk is not to try and walk up and pluck a hair from an elephant's tail. We don't want to do that. That's not going to end very well from us. But it helps us find animals a lot better you saw that footprint in the sand it is so difficult to see where they've walked so we're going to follow this animal pathway also the cars can't come here see this is not a road this was a pathway made by the animals and it goes to a watering hole so it's a very very big pathway lots of different animals will will use it so hopefully if we find a leopard or a lion or an elephant or a buffalo it depends on what happens. Sometimes you want to stay hidden. Sometimes you don't want the animals to know you're there. Sometimes you need to know, uh, need them to know that you're there. So you make a bit of a noise. You do something like that to get their attention, just so that you don't end up giving them a fright. And now one quick thing that I want to show you here is that there's a big footprint. We've just seen the dung of this animal. Two footprints here. An elephant has recently walked by too. So we need to now be careful and listen out for any elephants, any branches breaking, any trumpeting or anything like that. Because they could be thirsty too and on the way to the watering hole. But another creature that Ralph has is a watering hole. Probably not going to be as friendly as an elephant. Well, these crocodiles that we've found here on the island they're just lying getting nice and warm in the sun because you know that reptiles which crocodiles are they don't um, make their own heat so they need to lie up in the sun so that they can get their energy and then later they'll go and once they have enough energy they'll go back into the water and maybe do a bit of fishing because uh, the most uh, things that they eat is uh, down to fish and here in this waterhole is probably mostly catfish that they eat. I'm sure you know what catfish are. You get lots of them in America too. I've seen all sorts of different catfish in America and um, I know that some people go noodling as well where they tickle the catfish on their mouths and then they pick them up with their hands. Well, crocodiles don't do that. They literally just snap them up. But these two are not doing any snapping at the moment. Looks like they're just really enjoying the sunshine. Now, Ivan, uh, thanks for your question. I don't get very scared when I get up to the animals because I understand the animals. If they're getting scared of me or if they're getting angry with me, then I won't go any closer to them and I'll normally go away. Oh, look there. Look what Fergus has spotted. That's a African fish eagle. Wow. Look, he's probably also looking for some fish in the water. That's what they eat as well. So he'll be flying over the waterhole looking for fish with his super sharp eyes. And when he spots one, he might go down and swoop it off the water. Out the top of the water. Look at that. Wow. It's a very pretty eagle, isn't it? With brown wings and a white head all the way down to his tail. I'm sure he's going to go and land on that dead tree there. Let's see. Yep. Good landing. Did you see how his landing gear came out like wheels on an aeroplane? That was very well done. Now, sometimes they sit up on the tree. From there, they can look down into the water. And when there's some fish near the surface, then they can fly from there and catch the fish because they need to be near to the surface. Not like the African data that can swim down to very deep 
areas in the water and catch the fish. And the fish eagle needs to catch them off the top of the water. So they need to be pretty close and he needs to time it exactly right. Otherwise he'll just miss. And um, if he misses too many times he could get very hungry and then he would be uh, going to bed with an empty stomach which wouldn't be good but he's been here for a very long time so he's obviously a very good fisherman and that's why we call him a fish eagle and that's very very nice as well now Millie um, not all birds will eat worms like this big bird the African fish eagle he eats fish and so also does the African darter that you saw before but a little the more smaller birds and like little robins and forktail drongos all those little birds they like to eat worms but uh, not these big birds because if they had to eat worms they would have to eat a lot of worms don't you think because they're quite big so it's more the smaller little birds that like to eat worms well, there's all sorts going on here next to the water hole. But the crocodiles aren't doing too much. They're still just sitting there with the big smiles on their face. See how their teeth are showing out. And they're like living dinosaurs, aren't they? Look at those big claws on the end of their feet as well. And they use that to climb up in the mud. Because sometimes it can be quite slippery so it's like they've got um, different treads on their tires that they can use it to climb now Gabriel I don't know exactly how many teeth these crocodiles have they do have a lot and a lot more than we have in our mouths and a lot more than most animals because look how long his, his sort of snout is and there's teeth all the way along there and what I do know is is that they can replace them if one breaks off so they'll put another one coming through after that it's almost like us when you're growing up you do lose your baby teeth and then you get your next set well the crocodiles can keep replacing so they don't just get one extra set they'll get lots of them and so they use that also to be able to catch the fish that they eat and also sometimes they eat birds and even antelope and especially like uh, when the, the uh, antelope come down to drink then they might come up slowly just with their eyes showing at the top of the water just enough so that they can see the animal coming to drink and they go very very slowly and when the animal least expects it they grab onto him and pull him back down into the water and then they'll eat him in the water so crocodiles aren't all that friendly now don't be fooled by that happy smile he's got on his face because uh, he's a smiling assassin and the animals need to be very careful and you'll see when the animals come down to drink they are very wary because they know that there's crocodiles here and if they spend too long next to the side of the water they could get snapped up by the crocodile and that's why we also don't spend too much time next to the water as well Now, Caden, um, crocodiles aren't really known to take mud baths. They like to be in uh, water rather than in mud. But uh, there are some animals that do like to take mud baths, like the warthogs or pumba, as you might have seen on the Lion King, and buffalo as well. They also like the mud baths. And another one that's really big is an elephant. They like taking mud and throwing it behind their ears and on their back and on their belly as well and they, um, but crocodiles they just like to swim in the water and bask on the bank like this one is doing right now he's very well relaxed and he looks very very happy too he's not moving very much though he's very energy efficient he doesn't waste any energy at all all right, I think I'm going to move on a little bit because this crocodile is not doing very much. So let's go and look for some other animals, exciting animals. And while I'm doing that, let's head you back to Steve. Yes, well, crocodiles are the masters of doing not too much. 
and then out of nowhere they move at lightning speed that is how you save energy so Taylor's on bushwalk and they've got tracks of a female leopard so we're going there to go help because it's difficult to see a leopard on foot but you can see the tracks a bit easier so we're going to go there with the vehicle and hopefully we'll be able to find her and get a leopard for you nice and close well as close as we think is safe it's very important so it's very very important when you're tracking to be looking on the ground that's why i'm driving quite slowly it's one of the vehicles there good afternoon okay they're heading in the same direction but it's fine there's a road to the right coming up very shortly i'm going to go give taylor a hand so that's what's so good about being on foot is you get to see all the little tracks and signs on the floor it's like reading the newspaper every morning and afternoon it tells you exactly what's going on in and around and the watering holes are the places to check because these animals get thirsty so they have to go and drink so we're going to be getting close to Taylor very soon let's go and see exactly how she's doing well how exciting that we could be very very close to a leopard we found some more tracks Herbie found some more tracks and he said they were so fresh so we've called Steve to come and help us I was gonna show you something on a tree but Herbie has just called me now you can see that's Herbert there and he is an expert when it comes to picking up on tracks and signs of animals so to be a guide you have to be able to read what the bush is telling you what story has it got for us today Wow, Jaden, now your question is perfect because come look here. You've asked how big is a leopard's feet. Okay, well, there's one track there. Look at this one. Now, this isn't a very big track that we have here. If I put my hand next to it, look, you see it's quite small. But that is the leopard track and much bigger than a house cat's track and probably much bigger than an average paw print of a dog too. But... Uh, she hasn't got very, very big feet. We think that this is a leopard by the name of Tandy. Now, Tandy and, well, her mom, who's a very famous leopard in this area too, and she's taken over the spot now. And Tandy also has a daughter. These tracks are really, really fresh. It's a little bit windy today as well. So that's how we know that they're super fresh because there's very, very little dust in them. So that tells me that she was probably around here now. She was somewhere around here. But where? And those tracks go in this direction, straight down into this drainage line over here. So whew, it's very exciting. We must be very, very careful. So while we're looking for Tandy, we're going to be listening out for different types of sounds. Now, Yama, you've asked if I ever get scared of the animals and run away. That's one thing we're taught to not do is to run away from the animals. Because if you run away, uh, I suppose it's like a chase, especially if it's a predator. Not many things run away from like a leopard or a lion other than it's food. So they might think we're something to eat. But then also we don't act confident. And if you act confident and stand your ground and you say no to that elephant, it's probably going to run away from you. Because to be honest, they're really scared of people, the animals out here, the wild animals. Because lots, a long, long time ago, people used to hunt them and they became fearful of us they became really scared now we're trying to build a different relationship with them but um but yes yeah they get they get pretty scared of us sometimes they get a little bit scared and then when an elephant is shouting at you saying that he's unhappy you stand there like this don't run don't run don't run don't run you have to tell your legs but it takes lots and lots of training to not run because that's the biggest mistake you can make I'm so excited, I'm really, really am so excited that this leopard is close by. Now, what I wanted to tell you was that while we are here, and because you can see it's very, very thick, you see there's lots and lots of trees, we can't see very well. And Herbie's just walked through that little gap over there, he's almost invisible. We need to listen to the bush today. We need to listen to what it's going to tell us. Now, there are animals out here that don't like leopards either, because the leopards want to eat some things like impala and uh, steenbok and kudu and all these different types of antelope. So the, those antelope are going to be on our side, and so will the birds and the squirrels. So if they see a leopard, the squirrel's going to go, he's going to sit on his perch like this, and he's going to go, gee, 
feed you. And basically he's saying, Taylor, there's a leopard sensor. Herbie, come. Come here. This is where it is. And then we go and we get excited and we go to try and find it. Or the birds will be squawking and shouting. They're very, they don't really like any of the, any of the predators. So that's what we're going to be listening out for, especially while it's so thick here. But we're going to be quiet now. We're going to go and try and find Tandy. I know that Ralph has left to Chitwa Dam. I wonder where he's off to. Well, I'm not too far from Chitwa Waterhole because I managed to find some antelope. And look at that one. That one in front there is an Nyala. Nyala. So say that with me. Nyala. And that's what he is with nice, beautiful horns. There's no girls around, but uh, he is a beautiful animal, isn't he? And you see that white hair on the back that he has and how it's all standing up he uses that to display to the females and also to the other males to try and show how big he is and he's also got lots of hair underneath as well he's very very pretty I would say Now, Maddox, um, the animals don't really like the wind because it makes it quite difficult for them to hear when there's uh, predators approaching. And also, it can make them smell all sorts of things that they might think are, are dangerous. So they do get a little bit scared when it's quite windy. And you can see, I'm sure, Maddox, that's why you asked, this because it is quite windy, hey? It's blowing the hair on his back up as well as on his belly as he walks through. And these animals like staying in the thick bush and they feed on leaves. And that one lying down just as the Nyala walks past, that's an Impala with the nice big horns as well. But they eat grass and leaves. Oh, there's another ox pecker. That ox pecker is coming to look for ticks. He'll be going on the back of the impala, so he helps the impala by uh, pulling off the ticks, and then he gets food as well. Jalen, I would have to say that safaris are really, really fun. And I hope that someday you'll be able to come out and go on a safari of your own, for real. And in real life, you will really enjoy it, I'm sure. Because if you're enjoying it now, well, just imagine you were sitting here with me and you could hear all the sounds and feel the wind blowing through your hair. And you could also smell all the different things here too. It looks like that impala got a little bit irritated with those uh, ox peckers. Sometimes they don't quite enjoy it. It must tickle them when the birds are jumping around on their backs. And so they don't always just let them do what they want to. And he was just relaxing a little bit and those ox peckers made him get up. But well, maybe he's also a little bit hungry. There he goes. Now, Curtis, yes, uh, the antelope can use those horns for self-defense, but they also use it to fight between the different males and work out who's boss. So when they fight with each other, they'll run into each other with their heads, and then they'll try and stab each other with those horns. And very often they break those horns off as well. So they are very good tools, and they can try and use them for uh, defense against leopards and lions. But, um, well, the leopards and lions are normally too strong for them, and so they... Uh, they normally don't really work that well. The best defense for an impala is to run away and get away as quickly as possible from the leopards and lions. But this one doesn't seem to be getting away from anything. He's just having a nice relaxed afternoon. You see how his ears turn backwards and forwards? He's listening out for anything that he might uh, find dangerous that's coming towards him. Now, Yamaha, um, 
the animals, these antelope, they don't particularly go in the water. Um, only those water buck, they like to go in, into the water, but they need to be careful of the crocodiles. So they are a little bit careful. Um, water buck like going into the water, but the other antelope, they just go down to the water to drink, and then they go away because they all know that those crocodiles are there waiting, and if they stay there too long, they're going to become dinner. So they'll rather stay in the grass. That's where they're the most happy. And look how he's chewing his food. He'll swallow it down and then he'll bring it back up again and chew it again. It's almost like a cow because they've got a very similar digestion to a cow. And so you, you know how they say that cows chew the cud and then they swallow it and they bring it up again and they chew it again and then they swallow it. So they can do that three or four times before it actually stays down. And so he's got lots of chewing to do and that's why he also goes for a little rest because he needs to digest his food. It's almost like you've had a big Christmas dinner and your stomach is very big and it feels like you've eaten too much. You need to go and lie on the couch a little bit, hey? Because uh, it's not easy for your stomach to digest all that food. Well, I think that impala feels the same. And you can see how there's quite a bit of wind. Oh, look there, there's a hornbill. You know, Zazu on the Lion King? Well, this is his cousin. That's a little red-billed hornbill, because Zazu is a yellow-billed hornbill. He's got a yellow bill, but this one has a red bill. And look, he's looking for all sorts of little insects and berries or whatever he can find. They're not very picky. They'll eat anything that moves, or that looks like a little fruit as well, or a berry. And he's also not scared of eating ants and termites and uh, crickets and locusts and anything. As I say, that moves. Oh, and there's a starling with him. That one maybe spotted some food over on that side, and he thought he'd go over and join him. Hello, Mr. Starling. You see, watch how his color changes when he comes into the sun. See, he goes black, and then when he goes into the sun, he's going to go blue. Watch. That's because he's got special feathers that reflect the light and make him look like he's blue. But he's actually, there we go. You see that? He's actually black, but when it reflects the light, it makes it look blue. They're pretty birds, aren't they? And these little birds could look for worms. They won't pass up a little worm, like an earthworm. Maybe some caterpillars as well. But some of these caterpillars, you need to be quite careful to eat them, because they can be quite poisonous as well. Now... Another, something else you need to be careful of is a leopard or a lion, and I, and I know Steve's looking for those. We are indeed looking for this female leopard, but she's very, very sneaky. She looks just like the grass and the trees. So we just bumped into Taylor in the little depression there. And they're going to be scratching around a little bit longer to see if she comes out. We're just going to drive very slowly along this road to see if she crosses the road. Keeping our eyes very well peeled because she could be lying right there. And if we don't look closely, you will never see her. So, boys and girls, I wonder what, you know, if you've had any conservation initiatives in your lives, if you're paying attention to that back in your schools, planting trees, um... The importance of recycling and waste management is very, very important. We should all be moving away from plastic. I hope you all, all know that and agree with me. It's very, very important for our oceans, not just for where we are, but for the entire planet. Because what we must understand, and we show you a show just here from the savannah, where we see some interesting animals, but we're all connected we're connected to you all the way over there, the same air, the same water, all going into the sea. So very important that we are able to understand and, and that's why it's important to, to be educational and environmentally aware. Raisa, well, I thought by working, you want to know why I wanted to work for Safari Love. I thought I'd be able to give a broader message to the world. 
Um, I've been guiding for a long time. I'm very into environmental sort of things. And I thought that through this platform, because it's not just you guys who are watching right now, there's lots of people around the world who can watch this show for free. And so every now and again, I sneak in some nice environmental information as well as a leopard and a bird or two. So it's one of the things I thought I could do. I could try and, in my own little way, try and make a difference. So I hope when you go back from this show and you come back again, you'll have ideas of composting and recycling your waste. Okay, there's some impala over there. I wonder if that is an animal you haven't yet seen. Can you see them, Craigo? There's an animal over there. Okay, so Ralph showed you one. Now these impala, they like to make a noise when they see a leopard. A noise that goes <coughs> quite similar to that. You see how he's looking at us now? And the reason is that a lot of animals will shout at leopards because leopards and lions like to eat them. So they like to shout, so we're listening for their alarm calls, for their shouting. Uh, the bushwalk team is doing the same thing and if we hear them shouting well there's a very good chance that there's something there you see even the impala are very camouflaged in the trees over there not just the leopard wow Duria, how tall can an impala grow um about to my hip so what's that craig how tall is my hip let me look in the book I don't know the height of an impala. I should. Sorry, Duria. Let me switch off while we have a quick look. Marvelous little books. Okay, so 90 centimeters. There he is. I'm going to put that on the dashboard. There's a beautiful little impala. 90 centimeters. So, what's that? Three rulers. Not very tall, but it's the perfect food for leopard. They're not very big. They're not enormous. Um, there are lots of them. Lots of impala around. Oh, Craigo, can you see in the distance over there? In the open plains, busy feeding. We've got some wildebeest. I don't think we're going to get around there before the end of the show. Well, I'd like to thank all of you, Stokolosa Middle School, Merkland, Betty F. Williams. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on a wonderful Safari Live school program. We didn't manage to show you any leopards, but you're going to have to come back and you're going to have to tune in again. And remember, all of those conservation environmental initiatives, you need to start thinking about them on your, on your own and encourage your teachers and your schools and your parents. And while we do that, thank you for joining us and the wonderful questions. And we're going to go back over to Taylor and the Bushwalk team. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the school drive, and I hope the kids particularly enjoyed it. But we're starting the real safari now, and we're going to do a quiz. So I need to know from all of you, we're only giving you a little piece of this plant. What plant do we have here? Now, the way you can answer that, you can hashtag Safari Live, or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat, and I think also on Facebook on the various pages. So get your answers in. What plant do you think this is? I'll give you a clue. It's an invasive species. It should not be here. I've marked its spot because I, at some point, plan to come and dig it out my very, very self. Now, that's not all we've got to show you. We'll get back to that, and we'll discuss it a little bit more once we've got some answers. We've run more of Tundi's tracks. So while we were with the school drive, you know, we came, we showed you the ones on the road, and we came all the way down here, and they walk. So Tundi walks, walks through all the Tamwiti leaves, and then... Where did she go? I didn't mark a track. Yeah. And then she stepped here. Then she slightly, you can just sort of see, it's a very difficult track to see, but you can see there's an indentation. There's the pads. She stood over that leaf. And there's the toes there, and she walks. And then she goes straight through this drainage line now. And Herbie is up there investigating, trying to figure out where on earth she has actually gotten. So what we've obviously, the conclusion that I've come to is that every time I've ever walked Tundi, um, to be honest, it's, she's always had Tlalumba around. She's always had a cub around. And whenever we found her, she's fairly relaxed, but she's also not saying too much. She's sort of quite still watching us. She's quite protective. And every other time, we've tried to track her. When she doesn't have young Tlalumba around with her, she runs. 
So it's, I mean, I suppose that's a bit normal. Most animals aren't relaxed with us on foot, and perhaps she's just been hanging around um, to protect Clalamba. Anyways, we don't know where she is. She has to be around here some way. Ah, we've got some answers. <laughs> Justin coming in with a hilarious line saying that that is definitely a plant that you don't want to fall onto. Yes, because I've had a guess that has fallen onto that. I've told that story before. If you didn't get the answer now, you should guess it straight away. Let's see, next one. And the other guess is just Justin playing the game this afternoon. Okay, Robin, you said cactus. Let's just see if someone gets what specific kind of, I suppose, cactus it is. Anybody? Whee! Dale and a few others all exclaiming prickly pear. Fantastic. That's amazing. We're going to talk about this next. Right, you are correct in saying that it is a prickly pear. We've got two plants, one small one here, and then that's a little bit bigger. Now, they spread like absolute wild, wildfire, and uh, I'm surprised. Actually, there's a third one popping up just in there, and they're an absolute nightmare of a plant that unfortunately was introduced when the settlers started settling in South Africa. They brought that along. It was great fodder if you dry it up, and then it crushed down the leaves. Sorry, my shadow is on the plant. Um, so for sheep and goats and anything that they were bringing over, because remember, in the Eastern Cape, there wasn't really favorable grazing, so it wasn't really nice. And then along the West Coast, the Cape Town areas, again, the fane boss is not particularly good. It doesn't really um, sustain many animals. So they had to think of something. And then the other thing was is that they used this plant um, and they would plant it in hedges. It grows like wildfire and it grows in a great hedge shape. So when they started dividing land and claiming land, um, they would actually use this as sort of a, a fence line, if you will. And it's quite prevalent in the Eastern Cape. You can still see massive, massive hedges of it. So really a, quite a problem. Now, unfortunately, I don't see any cochineal on, on these plants. So cochineal is typically... Is to <laughs> Sorry, Herbie's whistling at me, but we'll, we'll get to him now. Um, but typically, cochineal is then introduced. Now, cochineal, if I'm not mistaken, they produce it in India. They still mass produce it for, for diet and insect that when you squash it. It has the most beautiful magenta purple color. And, and that actually, that insect will kill this plant. And then also you'll get an insect called a prickly pear moth, which is quite pretty. The larvae is orange with black little spots on it. And they'll eat their way on the inside of the leaf and then completely kill at that side. Now, if an elephant comes past you, they're not going to say no to this. They're actually going to break it off. And even with those really, really sharp prickles, uh, and elephants have worked out a way uh, of snapping it, and then you'll, it's the most amazing thing to watch an elephant remove the prickles from a prickly pear leaf, is that they'll put it on the ground underneath their foot, and then basically, I suppose I can demonstrate for you, because, well, this is an invasive species and it's not supposed to be here. You've got to be careful with a prickly pear, though, because there's little hairs on it. Let's see if I can snap this leaf. That was easier. Just use my foot. Okay, so what they'll do is the elephants will use their trunks and very delicately break the leaf. They'll then put it onto the ground, and you'll normally see them standing on it and then doing this. And then they'll investigate with their trunks, and then they'll flip it over do the same thing. They don't get all the prickles off, but they do tend to get most of them. And then they pop it in their mouth. And I suppose it's like eating an, an icicle, well, not an icicle, but like an ice, icy pop. Uh, we would call them, what would we call those frozen, I don't know, frozen juice, basically. <laughs> a lolly. I don't know. I'm trying to think of, I can't even think of the thought. So. A frozen lolly is probably what the word that I'm looking for. Anyway, so they'll do that. But now the problem with this is that even if I, we should almost do an experiment. Shall we try and do an experiment? I'll come and remove this. Let's put this in the ground and see if we can get it to grow. Because this plant is unbelievable with the way that it spreads roots. I once saw... Uh, why, and the reason why, um, or oh, how I know this, is that the one day I saw a whole tree that had fallen over and had been uprooted, obviously by elephants, and there was some leaves that I tried to sort of pick it up and move it off the road, and I couldn't because all the roots had basically spread from the underside and down into the ground. Now, I'm not actually going to grow this plant. I just want to see if the next few weeks if we can 
see some roots starting to sprout and and then I will probably have to come out and dig this out so I'm gonna in order to try and remove this I'm gonna have to remove the entire plant fire works well too fire can get rid of it but very cool not cool to see it out here though and hopefully the elephants don't find it before I remove it otherwise they're gonna spread it all over the reserve right let's go to uh, Steve who's also in the area driving around Yes, thank you, Jamie. And, um, well, that is uh, fantastic. You know, this little game that we call each other different names, that's um, something that we do out here just to take the mickey, if you know what that means. But anyway, I'm on my way to Biffle's Hook Waterhole. I'm just combing the perimeter because this afternoon, um, midday, Herbie and I went out and we were really following on the tracks of Tandi and Tlalamba. Now I'm interested to see, um, because it was around a similar time that uh, there was alarm calls just behind our camp um, that uh, we got from Nyala. And I think Conrad, the tech guy, he picked that up. And so thanks Conrad, but I'm just interested to see whether uh, Herbie and Taylor are right that that's Tundi on that side. Um, because we seem to have uh, uh, eliminated all the spots that Tandy wasn't and we had then narrowed it down to one block which is where I'm on my way to now and if um, if that is indeed Tandy down there by them then we missed something the way she had crossed and and uh, went out but I'm pretty sure that Tlalamba is still uh, definitely up here so maybe Tandy's down there but it could also be Shudulu that's uh, interesting to see the only way to find out is obviously for one of them to find that kitty cat that's walking around there and has been walking around there um, since before lunchtime so I'm going to head to the Biffles Hook waterhole, see if I can uh, spot still. I think that Tandi Tlalamba might be there and that might be a different cat, but we'll see when we get there. And it's quite interesting as well, because when we went to Biffles Hook at midday, um, Scuba Steve, the hippo um, that we saw there this morning, was absent as well so we were actually quite cautious because you know that you should never especially on foot get between a hippo and his safe spot which is the water so you know walking around a pan when you know that there's a hippo nearby um, is actually quite uh, uh, nerve-wracking because you know that he could burst out of the bush at any moment and make for the water it's not that he wants to flatten you but if you get in between him and the water you will be literally flattened uh, like a pancake and that's what often happens to people what bird was that it looked like a nice bird that flew through there did he go and land it looked like a bird of prey maybe something like a dark chanting goshawk but I don't know where he landed. I think he might have continued on his way. And so we'll do the same. And so, yeah, that's, um, that's my plan for now. And obviously still looking out for some elephants or lions that have possibly re-entered into the property because it, for the moment, seemed like um, the Inkahumas or it was actually unidentified lions this morning. We know that on the dam cam there was lions heard calling um, and on Biffles Hook the guys had fresh tracks but I think they were struggling to find those lions and there was definitely male tracks in there as well. And I also found some lion scat next to Biffles Hook um, so I might have a look, re-look in there and who knows if we're lucky the lions might return this side as well. Now I know that Steve's trying to uh, find that leopard, I hope he does, let's go see how he's doing. Yes, well we are trying very hard, um, the Herbie's directed us around the block and uh, nothing. Ralph, make sure you don't step in that lion scat like Herbie did the other day, it's very slippery and it smells, as you know, very bad. Very, very bad. So Tandy is playing her usual tricks today. You know. Okay, well there's... Those are tracks from the other day. I can see my shoe. So everybody, how are we all doing this afternoon? We are driving into the setting sun 
on the Sunset Safari here in Juma in the Sabi Sands and we are always excited to be out. It is a beautiful afternoon. I'm just going to listen for a moment. Let's just listen. It's a very, very quiet, in fact. I can hear my heart beating. Don't forget to send through your questions and comments. Hashtag Safari Live or whatever stream it is that you are following. Let us know what's happening in your world. Don't forget, if you are a new viewer, this is interactive. Kathy, I would love to show you your daily dose of cuteness. I really would. But um, um, I don't know where she is. But anyway, Ralph is going to be in the area up there, it sounds like, where, where he was with her yesterday. I've no doubt Columbus very close to where they left her yesterday. Uh, we picked up on Tony's tracks this morning, and that's what Herbie's busy following at the moment. Um, he's directed me in this direction, but nothing came across the road. So we're going to carry on on our original plan. It seems as if Ralph is going to have the, the Columba area covered. I'm going to keep listing for Herbie, see if, if he comes back with any more information. But I also let him know that nothing seems to have crossed in a westy direction. There's some elephant tracks though. That would be nice for the afternoon. And now I headed in this direction see them in the road nice one on top of the mound there thank you Marcy thank you Marcy sometimes it just takes a little comment like that to perk me right up and here you can see the tracks of the elephants moving moving here you can clearly see I'm sure you can we've got the front foot can you see that Craigo it's very round. Here is where the toe is scuffed going forward, and here is the back foot going up the mound. Also, the toe is scuffed. Now, if you can't see it clearly, I'll demonstrate with my own shoes next to it. As I walk, I kick with my toe. Oh, that's not a very good one. As I walk, kick with my toe. Can you see that? So the elephant puts all of its weight, just like my shoe, on the back. So you get a very clear, shiny bit at the back. And then because the toe is moving forward, that's where the weight or the toe is digging in. Just like mine, there's a bit of a scuff. And sometimes when the sand is or the ground is not very soft like this, all you get is that shiny bit at the back. And now we've got the front foot. Here it is. And here is the back foot. It's just in front. Can you see that? There's no real gap here which means that elephant was walking at quite a medium pace. Not fast, just a very slow meander, but then you must also bear in mind that it was coming uphill. So elephants often go slowly uphill, and then downhill they go faster, but over a period of time, you'll see how that changes. And often when elephants are going to water, they start moving a bit quicker, and once they've moved away from water, they kind of will feed and meander in sort of like a, an angle like this makes it much easier to track when they're walking in a straight line like this this is from earlier today they can cover a very large distance even walking very slowly like that sorry Lou I had my volume down I just heard clicks in my ear sorry I didn't get the question <laughs> okay well we're gonna carry on in a westy direction sort of westerly and see what we come across Hello, and we are nearly here at Biffle's Hook Waterhole. And if you don't know what that means, that is an Afrikaans word for buffalo corner. So Biffle, meaning buffalo, and hook, 
or hooky, it's a corner. So this is right up in the corner and obviously I'm sure historically there's been a lot of buffalo here at this waterhole. Now a lot of the names that um, are given to different waterholes and uh, places or river lines or roads, uh, a lot having to do with which animals have been predominantly in that area. You know, you've got Tambuti Dam, you've got, what's all the roads we've got? Um, Niala Road, we've got Vulture's Nest, um, not all of them obviously in Afrikaans, Savage's Track, I don't know who made that name, but uh, I wonder what happened there. Uh, Shibamu, what is a Shibamu? Uh, you must know, Ferg, it's not a Shudulu, a Shudulu is a, um, that is a termite mound, but a, but a shibamu, that's right, thanks Louise, you just reminded me, of course I know what shibamu is, it's a, it's a weapon or a rifle, um, so that's weapon or rifle road, and then um, Balanites, obviously after the Torchwood, uh, which is on there, Impala Road, Galago, you know what Galago means, that's Bush Baby, the Latin name for Bush Baby. And Aubrey's, obviously Aubrey's uh, named after Aubrey, uh, one of the long-time employees here and one of the rangers. Sandy Patch, obviously that's because there's a big Sandy Patch. Mvubu, <laughs> unless it was Sandy that worked here, maybe she worked in one of the lodges. Um, Mvubu, Mvubu is um, exactly what we're looking at in front of us. It's a hippo. So Shangan, Zulu and Osa for Hippo. Now let's just have a look here at Buffalo's Hook or Buffalo Corner waterhole. See if there's anything that's coming down except for Scuba Steve who has returned. So I think we were on the button by being cautious a little bit earlier because um, he was indeed somewhere here in the thickets and we could have gotten ourselves into trouble as I say if we continued walking around and it looks like he's looking at me menacingly as if um, I'm the one that got away because he could have sorted me out. Right, there's not too much happening at the waterhole here. It's quite blustery and windy. So I think I might continue on my search for Tandi and Klalamba because that's heading out onto um, Med uh, Gwari Road, you see, another road that's named after what is um, generally around the, the area. There's lots of guaris next to the guari pan. Guari being those t uh, little bushes with the wavy leaves and the little berries on them. Lots of the birds and things are eating them now. So we're going to continue on our tracking, try and find these leopards. Sooner or later, one of us are going to come right. And um, well, let's go over to Taylor and see if she's had any more luck. I'm loving the optimism this afternoon, Ralph. You go, boy. Now, we found something that um, it should not be growing in this tree, but it is not growing in the tree. It is uh, not an orchid of any sorts or any kind of epiphyte, but basically, I think the elephants were down in here, munching away, having the time of their life as they normally do. And then, obviously, someone pulled up this, and uh, instead of shaking it all loose and eating it, kind of just chomped it off, you can see. So they've left all, all the, the roots and the soil, and then they've sort of munched it off here. Let me, sorry, let me turn it this way, it's a bit difficult to try and grab. See, look there. See how they've chewed it off? So that's just like elephants feeding, throwing things around. It's always quite funny to see where, um, where elephants end up losing their food. My other favorite thing is to find elephant dung in all sorts of places other than on the floor. And not for me putting that in random places, but some, of course you've seen how elephants, the youngsters especially, like to climb over things. Sometimes, well, they relieve themselves while they're doing those activities too. And, uh, <laughs> and then it's always quite funny to see where the dung has landed. But quite nice, shall we just dispose of it on the ground? I'm now OCD and I must take it all out. I don't know why I must take it out. Oh, no, that's just... There. Anyway, so I'm walking a route that I haven't actually walked before, which is quite nice. And it seems as though we're not alone on this part. Back quickly, have a look here. It says a little track. So there's a toe, there's a toe, there is also a toe. 
and it's quite small. I mean, in comparison to my hand, if I put it over, the track is much bigger than my hand. This is from a young rhino. So how cool is that? Along this animal pathway, and and obviously been walking with mom up and down this way. But it's always quite nice to see a small track. Now you can get very easily confused. I always find with black tracks, but luckily. Might just be because sorry, there's a little bit of break up there. It might just be because we are down in a drainage line. So we show us um, here. You know, everybody knows that they are around. We need to be careful of them because, in fact, in my opinion, that's the animal that we bump into into most is, uh, of course, the rhino. So we're going to carry on down this pathway, but hopefully we're going to bump into a leopard. Let's go see where Steve is. Well, thank you all for your comments and letting us know what it is you're up to today, grocery shopping and all the other interesting activities. Glad that you are making time to watch the show and tuning in, doing your stretches and very good. Welcome, everybody. If you are just joining us now, it is a wonderful afternoon in the Sabi Sands. And uh, hopefully, we are going to find something big and hairy soon. John, I love the sounds. I love the smell and the sounds. Just the way that being in the bush activates the senses. When we live in a city, the city is smells, it's noisy. Uh, we're unfriendly. Um, you, you, you block all of that out. Your senses sort of... You do this in the city because you don't want to be involved in all of it. But out here, you get in tune with your senses. You, you're forced to smell and to hear. Um, and it's quite amazing. Like, I'll drive like this, exactly like this, and I'll stop with guests and I go, Ooh, do you smell that? And I'll drive back and go, smell? <laughs> oh, do you smell that? It's popcorn. Do you smell that leopard urine? And everyone gets excited. Imagine doing that in the city. People think you're mad. But out here, they pay me to do that. It's fantastic. Activate your senses. Isn't that what everybody wants to do in their daily lives, is activate senses? But unfortunately, the noise and smells of cities can be quite overwhelming. So that's what I love about our chairs. It's tranquil. Even though there are noises, they are peaceful bush noises that make you feel quite at home. I think the, the human spirit evolved in Africa and we are quite in tune with the crackling of a fire and the, the sounds of hippos in the night and the whooping of hyenas as they run around doing their thing and the droom, roar of the lion in the night time or in the early morning it just makes the hairs on the back of the neck stand up so that I think is one of the most important things is how it activates the senses being out here oh, I hope I've answered your question So there's a sixth sense that develops as well. There's a gut feeling. There's a gut feeling that helps you to find lots of things. And many, many times we have found things just by our instincts. Well, yeah, you found me now. So my favorite thing about the bush I can't quite put my finger on one, but um, maybe I'll just say some of my favorite things about the bush. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, like I was doing today with Herbie, tracking and trying to, well, tracking and trailing uh, especially, so identifying a track, following it and attempting and hopefully finding the animal that you have been looking for. It, it's just such a, a real rewarding um, exercise exercise to, to go through that uh, especially when you do find the animal um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those feelings that you just really feel uh, is an accomplishment um, especially when you've spent some time doing it you know I've done it from desert elephants I've done it from desert days with a vehicle and talking to different uh, villages, people in different places. And you know, you get to one village and the guys point that way, um, where the elephants last went, and then the next village nearby, they say the other way. And, and well, you start putting the story together, um, 
and eventually, you know, you, you work yourself up to this climax of uh, eventually finding the animal. Um, out here, a little bit different. Obviously, we're not going to villages, and we're literally walking on the trail. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, going ahead and leapfrogging and, and working out where the animal has actually moved. And then um, when you find that the reward at the end is so worth it. It's not always that you do find the animal. Like today, we didn't find Tandi and Tlalamba, but we, we spent some good hours trying. Um, and that's what I'm trying to follow up on now. But uh, it's still so rewarding to um, get that feeling. And, and you know, even if um, we were totally wrong and Tandi did give us the slip and she went down and uh, Steve and uh, Taylor find her, well, then that gives us reason to go back and work out where we went wrong. Um, or at least to think about it and work out where she, she crossed over and we missed it. So that's one of my favorite things. Another thing I have to say is that I think, you know, out here in wildlife, it's, it really lives in the moment. I know that lots of animals, you know, they maybe plan ahead a little bit and they also learn from the past, but it's real life in the moment. I think that for me is one of the most amazing things about being out in the bush. You know, when you're tracking Tandi and Klalamba, you're right in that moment and nothing else matters. Um, you're not thinking about uh, next week, um, you know, what you need to be doing then. You're not thinking about what happened last week. You're thinking about the track. Um, you're listening to the sounds around you and you are right there in that moment. Um, and the animals obviously do that uh, very often too, uh, mostly. And there's not too much emotion in it. It's just basically thinking on your feet and doing what you have to to survive. So uh, that's probably one of the things that really I enjoy. Um, you know, and when you go back to town, it's all of a sudden all of this stuff piles up and uh, it reminds you what it is to be a human again with all the baggage that comes with it. But being out here in the bush, really, you, you can almost breathe and uh, the baggage sort of takes a back seat. Um, it's always there, but uh, it's nice to, to be able to release a bit here in the wild in the wild. Now, in this very moment, I would love to get some sort of sign of these leopards. Some noise, some track. I've really searched and searched, but I'm, I'm still working the same area that we seem to have finally, that um, she's in here somewhere. So I'm not going to give up, um, and I hope Steve isn't either. Well, we had a few magpie shrikes a moment ago, and as the birds do, they flew away, and so we just jumped across quickly to the hornbill, yellow-billed hornbill, who is probably uh, benefiting from the magpies around, because obviously they might hunt differently and seek out their food differently, and the hornbill, who's eyeing himself around there, will try and capitalize on any food that escapes. Go, there's a, a starling, a virtual starling with a nice long tail and the black eye is busy chirping away. Herbie is busy calling me from oh, hold on a second folks. We watch the birds standing by. Okay, we need to go. On my way, he is calling me quickly to where we've where we've been. Mendoza. Okay, let's go to Taylor quickly see what they found. Herbie, I'm not going to hang here because we don't have their like we're live. We don't have vision. I'm going to go back to my spider. Is that fine? Sorry, we've <laughs> you've not caught us in the act. Um, We've got a leopard, but we can't see the leopard at the moment. She's flat, so there's no point in even trying to show you because I can't see it yet, but I left a really cool spider that I really want to go back to. We're calling Stephen at the moment. Sorry, yeah, this is awkward. Herbie, please can we walk a little bit just to that tr and, and see you again? Yeah. You think, no, you can hear me. It's fine. We can, 
Well, we're going to just slowly move away. Herbie's got her eyes, eyes sorry, on Sandy. Sorry, that was, it all just happened really quickly. Okay, slightly. I'm going to try and remember where we were. Do you remember where we were, Senzo? It was here at this tree. Yeah. Come with us. We're just going to walk really just calmly. Maybe she thinks we don't know that we can see her. Oh, luckily it's still here. Come and have a look at this. Sorry, everybody. It seems you're having some technical difficulties on our side with the bushwalk. Okay. We are having some issues outside where we're going to try and get Steve into this leopard. I'm going to try and get another view of the spider. Let's go to Rolf with African Hawk Eagles. Yes, an African hawk eagle it is, and it is a beauty, and sitting out beautifully in the light there, it's a shame, a little bit of a shadow on its um, belly there, but it is still very, very pretty, and normally you also see African hawk eagles in pairs, but obviously they do need to pair up for them to be in pairs, so maybe this one hasn't found its pair just yet, or its mate, but generally, if you see them flying out, you often, often see African hawk eagles in pairs. And um, they can be mistaken with the Ayers hawk eagle or also the osprey. They look quite similar, um, but obviously they slightly different habitats and distribution as well. And that is a very, very nice individual, that. Normally soaring in the morning too. A very, very clear, distinguishable characteristics there. You see that just that yellow around the eye, and then lots of um, little blotches on the chest, black blotches, as well as the white underbelly, and then black wings. They are very pretty. And look, you see how it's trying to just balance a little bit in the gusty wind. You can see how the trees wobbling too. Birds normally face into the wind as, you, as you'd expect if it's very windy so, because it does sort of ruffle their feathers if uh, they side on or backwards it can really push them quite a lot more so if they just face into the wind then they're aerodynamic and very easy to sit then. And this one quite happy to sit here it's not often that we get so close and they actually relax and let us watch them. And birds are quite difficult to get on the screen sometimes. Jilly, this is about 60 to 65 centimeters from the tip of its tail to uh, the top of its head. So in comparison, um, the African fish eagle is not much bigger than that. Um, because the fish eagle, yes, its uh, wingspan will be quite a bit bigger, well, broader at least, um, because they carry quite a bit of weight. Uh, and you generally know if a, if a bird carries a lot of weight, they normally have broader wings, like the crowned eagle uh, probably carries the most weight of all the birds in Africa, and they can carry monkeys and small antelope. They don't have the longest wingspan, but they've got the broadest. Um, and so fish eagle also has very broad wingspan, but um, uh, the uh, African horse eagle does have a decent uh, length of wingspan as well. But, uh, yeah, so 60, 65 centimeters, so just over half a meter. So it's not, it's not a massive raptor, but uh, it's not tiny either. It's, I mean, if you look at a little shikra, which is a little banded goshawk or a lizard buzzard, I mean, they, that's, that's at about uh, 15 to 20 centimeters. Um, so this is, you know, three times the size of those smaller little guys and very very good sharp eyes and I'm sure that it's scanning around all the time looking for food and it would attack with its talons and then rip at with its very sharp bill. And Kerry you say that it's a beautiful bird 
Absolutely agreed. I would really, uh, I do really, really enjoy watching African hawk eagles. They are very beautiful birds. And this one, especially, sitting perfectly in the light for us. That is very pretty and looking almost straight at us as well. So, always nice to spend a little bit of time with him, but uh, obviously if he's just going to sit still, we won't stay with him for too long. But, um, you know, they've got very, very sharp eyes. They can see long distances, um, quite monocular vision almost. So they don't like all the other birds um, and reptiles as well, mostly. Um, they've got very uh, good eyesight. They can see far, but they don't have a very good um, uh, depth of vision. So they do need to shift their head around, especially when they get sight of a target, just to see exactly how far it is. Um, so not as easy with that depth estimate. Look at that, you can see the tip of that bill is really what makes this one of the raptors. Uh, Carla, this is, this is an eagle. Um, it's classified as one of the eagles and it is a true eagle as well because the feathers which, which are just hidden behind that, um, that uh, branch there, the feathers come all the way down to the bottom uh, right down to the tail, not to the talons, but to the toes. Um, and the, 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 the eagles that are not true eagles are like your snake eagles um, and any of those that their, their legs are bare. So yes, this is definitely a, a true eagle, an African hawk eagle. It, uh, it's, I think, because it's um, quite hawk-like that they call it a hawk eagle. It's like a cuckoo hawk. Um, it's a hawk that looks like a cuckoo, um, but it is a hawk, if you see what I mean. So if they had to swap that around, if they had to say African eagle hawk, um, it would probably be a hawk that looks like an eagle, which we don't have, but that would be exactly what it would be if we did. Oh, look at that little wobble. Obviously, just getting his wings ruffled out there. Now, Zach, um, if we want to tell between the different birds of prey, look what we, we look at how big the bird is and the particular shape that it has because um, uh, this African hawk eagle looks different to the uh, African fish eagle that we saw earlier. Um, and this one is black with white. Um, and that African fish eagle is brown and white. So, and they've got a totally different shape too. So that's how we would, you know, first up, um, that's what we would look at. And then, um, and then we see where it, where it is. You know, the African fish eagle is always normally found next to the water, whereas uh, this African hawk eagle isn't. Um, so we look at that. Then we can look at smaller things like the color of its legs, the co color of its bill, the color of its eyes. And so we can then, oh, and as we suspected, it's just flown off. It's just going to fly up in front of us and down the road. And you might also notice that there's going to be some birds chasing it. Wow, Ferg, that's very, very skillful following through the brush. I wonder if he spotted something down there. It looked like he went down, eh? I wonder if I go forward a little bit, we might be able to see what he went for. I'm not promising anything because uh, it will be quite difficult, but it looked like he went down there. Let's just have a look. So, yes, Zach, we look for all sorts of different characteristics and... Um, and then we use all of those to work out exactly. And we use our book. We use our bird book. Like with our binoculars, we look at all the different little uh, differences with that bird. I doubt I'm going to find this guy. He's in the grass there. If we can't find a leopard in there, we won't be finding that bird. But I'll just drive slowly here and see. Maybe if I turn off and he did catch something, we might hear it squealing. Maybe it was a little mouse. I'll just roll down here with the engine off because we're going downhill. Let's see. I doubt we're going to be able to see it. But you never know. I'll just get lucky. 
There's a squirrel now moaning. I'm pretty sure it's because of that eagle. Squirrels can also get eaten by that eagle. The life of a squirrel. Also pretty much have to be scared of everything, but at least they normally have quite good vantage points. Yeah, he's moaning at that squirrel. Uh, I mean the squirrel moaning at the eagle. Excuse me. They don't stop. No. It's obviously gone down in the grass there. Somewhere. So Okay, let's I think start up and let's go on a little bit. We'll do a little bit more looping, see what else exciting we can find. That was a wonderful sighting that. And that African hawk e hawk eagles. Ooh, hello. Now I'm going to be asking Steve which kitty cat has he found? Okay, copy this. She's just here next to me. If you can see me, she's just three, four meters in front of my left wheel. So if you can get through there, welcome. Aubrey, if you can get my visual, she's just here on my left-hand side. And we might just want to give her a few minutes to relax um, from the bushwalk team moving out. Okay, so everybody, we have managed to find her. And look who it is. I was just communicating with the other vehicles. So, um, they obviously want to come in and see her, but we need to be sensitive. We need to make sure that she relaxes again. They always do get a little bit nervy when they see us on foot. But she was giving a looking at Herbie. But she's okay. We can see her ears. She's paying attention. Herbie said she had a kill, but I can't see it anyway. How marvellous is that? So she was here the whole time. She was here the whole time, just on the other side of the road from the um, from the watering hole. Very, very cool. It's one of the benefits of the bushwalk team and this is the area where we kept losing her the other day. She was up and down, up and down. Well, have you found Tandy? How excited is everybody? Now, oh, there she is, folks. There she is. Okay, so I'm just going to move, make just a little bit of space so that this other vehicle can come in. Ooh, what's she doing? What's she looking at? It's going to move over a little bit, Crago. Oh, there's the face. Okay, I'm going to just. I'm going to just stop now and see where she goes before I move anyway. Hello, girl. There she is. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she an absolutely glorious cat? Just gorgeous, says Louise. Just love how the tail plays and moves. Well done, Herbie and Taylor, for all your hard work. They knew she was here. They knew she was in the area. And I don't think she's she caught a Daco or anything. It was probably hard for them to tell. But that's kind of the behavior she's doing now. Walks through, sniffing underneath bushes. Maybe she's got something inside there. Maybe that's where Herbie saw her before. She might have just moved off away from from the meat. They do do that, leopards. And they have a look at how invisible she is. If Craig just backs out very slightly on the camera, look at her gone. Gone. Now we've got to see that from a moving vehicle. <laughs> if it wasn't for the tip of the tail, we wouldn't see her. Oh, she's behaving as if she's got something in there. Um, so we might try and see if we can sneak up a little bit closer and see what we can see. 
Well, while we do it, let's go over to the champions of the bushwalk this afternoon and see what their thoughts are. I've got my cell phone out now because I want to show you all... I want to show you all a spider quickly. Maybe you can help me. I saw the spider, but I didn't want to move it from its perch. And hopefully... Senzo, you're going to have to tell me how to angle it. Is that fine? Yeah. So can you see everything? Yeah. Everybody ready to watch? What is that? Now, I think it's a kind of a lynx spider because it's got a very long sort of elongated cephalothorax. So I don't know what it is. It had lots of little spines on its legs, though, as you could see. And it had the most amazing colors from greens to white and black and a bit of red and orange on it, too. And it was sitting on the tree. It wasn't a small spider either. It was quite big. I mean, you can see that the ant was there. Should we play it once more? The ant was there for scale. You'll see the little cocktail ant walking around. That's amazing. If you know what kind of spider this is, I can't say that I've ever seen one. Anyways, I think it's a kind of a lynx spider. That's, what, that's the only familiar thing that I can think of. But um, maybe some of you have a spider book handy. No, I don't really know what we're going to be doing for the rest of the afternoon. Ooh, little spin. I'll walk backwards for a change. How's that, Senzel? We're going to walk on the road, though, because I'm not as skilled as Senzel. He can walk backwards through hectic terrain. Um, so, yeah, it is a roll reversal. So basically, so I was just looking, I thought it was an elephant, it's not a termite mount behind, quite far behind us. Um, I don't know where we're going to go now. I mean, that was our goal, was to just try and find leopard. That all the credit goes to, of course, um, Herbie. That um, all goes to him. We were so busy faffing over that spider and we knew that the leopard was around. We weren't going anywhere. Basically, we had said that, that um, we were going to hang around in the area until we could hear an alarm call or anything like that. So it was quite cool. So we heard the go-away birds making a little bit of chatter. And then I said to Herbie, I was like, is that bird alarming at you? Is it alarming at us? He says, he's not sure. So we sort of sat and we listened. We're looking at the spider, trying to figure out what it is. Herbie took, he maybe walked off about 50 meters from where we were. He just said he wanted to look on a big animal pathway. And then that's where he saw the leopard. It just went flat in the grass like that. So we couldn't, so we couldn't see the leopard at all because he called me. He went normal signal he's seen something he's got something come so we went and we looked couldn't see a thing he was trying to explain to where it is he says she's sitting so flat in the grass you would not even know that she's there and then we didn't know what to do but she was she was quite far away as well so it was probably about 80 to 100 meters away from us it would have been quite difficult to sort of see on the camera but luckily steve wasn't too far away could come in and see her so that's nice so that solves the mystery of all the alarm calls that we've been hearing the entire day the whole day from the wildebeest to impala from the squirrels and franklins all of the things all of the things were shouting out loud so now i don't know what to do now we're going to see what other cool insects we can find i suppose so i'll be checking pieces of grass and turning over leaves who knows maybe a caterpillar will make an appearance anyways let's uh, go to ralph to see if he's still trying to follow those african hawk eagles no i'm not following the hawk eagle but i do want to just see if fur can just get a picture in on those very difficult birds to follow and those are white crested helmet shrikes and that one looks like he's killed something or is busy killing something and trying to swallow it look at that oh, they are cooperative breeders so they can often share their food but it looks like that one is not being shared this time and they're very interesting because they actually with those sort of fluffy helmet type uh, structures that they've got on their head they actually use that to collect spiders webs um, and then they use that for for nest building material um, and as I say cooperative breeders so you do get them helping each other for the better good of the family um, and so but it's always difficult they flit in and they off they go difficult to get a picture on them so it seems that uh, we did miss those tracks of Tandi going past us this morning I was hoping that that was going to be Shudulu and I could have continued on my search around uh, Biffle's Hook so um, I have left that area completely because I'm not going to be looking for Tlalamba who's on uh, her own and I think she's in there uh, all alone at the moment um, 
and we'll leave her be now that Tandy's left her because uh, she'll also know just to be very uh, inconspicuous and hide away and we don't want to bump her out of her little hiding place so what we'll do now is we'll go and look for Mr. Shy or the Duke of Duma Tingana uh, heading towards Twin Dams and then maybe up towards Treehouse Dam drive the sort of southern southern section of the Juma Traverse heading towards um, the western section and I'll go and see maybe the cheetahs make a reappearance maybe um, one of uh, Shudulu or Hukumuri make a reappearance um, but uh, as always we'll stop for everything else in between that we can find along the way and it's been nice that I've done quite a few birds today it's been uh, very interesting I like doing birds and it's nice because on the bushwalks at present, I must say that it's actually quite difficult to find little arthropods and insects and all sorts because, you know, a lot of things are dormant at the moment or in their egg phase or in their larva. So not that easy to find too much life when you're walking around now. That's why it's nice to actually follow an animal trail and track uh, at this time of year when you're on foot. Um, and it is a bit easier too because a lot of the trees and grass sort of you know lies down there's not as much vegetation not as much leaves and so you can see quite a bit easier through the thickets but for now not seeing too many animals but that's how it goes sometimes very quiet 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 and then bang all of a sudden the bush comes alive that's what i'm hoping for as we come down now we Oh, and there we go, there's a giraffe. Hello, Mr. Giraffe. Now, Samantha, um, you know what I would really like to see is a pangolin. I haven't seen a pangolin in a few years. Now, I'm just going to stop here and let this giraffe decide what he wants to do. Um, and sorry, Ferg, I'm probably going to be messing you around because I'm going to follow him in a minute. We'll give him a chance. He's just moved into the sun and he might go across the road there. A giraffe can be so skittish sometimes. Oh, and he's starting to feed there. So I might move forward and see if we can get a bit closer. So yes, I think one of the most amazing animals to see and because they're so rare, a pangolin. Um, but I'm always very excited to see any of the, the rarer animals like an art wolf or a bat-eared fox. Uh, quite uh, unusual to see them around. And the honey badgers, don't see them too often. But uh, well, we'll settle for this pretty giraffe here who's having a nice feed. Let's stop just there. Can watch him. What's he feeding on there? Looks like one of the old acacia plants. No, it's not an acacia. Is that a, a young leadwood, I believe? I think it is. They're very dexterous picking out with that. It's a good looking bull, I think. There come the ever present ox peckers. Yeah, he's bald on the top of his ossicones. So definitely a bull, very much like humans, that they go bald with age, not all humans, and a very big sort of forehead, it's like a club, it's almost like callus that he gets on there, and typical giraffe, don't hang around for too long. Now, I'll, I think it's Altar Buck. Um, Animals, yeah, the, the, I, don't, I haven't really noted too much of, oh, Walt R. Buck. Okay, sorry, I got your name a little bit wrong there. I don't know if animals getting too constipated, um, you know, especially like the antelope and that. Uh, what they do get, I think, um, 
not not the antelope because they're eating grass and so on. Oh, it looks like he's having a scratch there. Let me see if I can get a nice view on it. Yeah, I oh, know he's reaching up. Um, but like lions and the predators, like dogs, like your common domestic dog at home, um, they often get like an acid reflux, and so they eat grass to try and assist with that. I'm not going to go too far forward. I'm just going to see that I'll stop here. There we go. Look at that. The guy's stretching up. So I don't really know if animals getting too constipated. You know, often also um, people think that, uh, you know, sometimes dogs and cats and any of the animals with um, with an anal gland, which is a gland just on the inside of the anus, um, that they naturally use to mark their territories and, uh, you know, for all sorts of pheromones that they put out. Um, that little gland can get... Um, swollen if it's not you know if it doesn't uh, uh, press out the, I think it's like an oily substance uh, enough and then you can see dogs cats not as much in the cats but more so the dogs um, wiping their bum on the ground you know and at home in, in people's houses you often see them doing it on a carpet um, but it's actually that that gland is not released properly and so it obviously gets swollen and can get a bit sore and I do know of um, friends of mine that have actually taken their dog to the vet and they've literally milked that anal gland because, it, you know, it wasn't uh, exiting properly and then the, then the dog was fine after that. So, but I don't know too much about constipation in animals. But, you know, I'm not a vet and... Um, any of you that do know of constipation in animals, or wild animals especially, please feel free to send it to us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And we'll be very interested to note. I've never seen a giraffe constipated. They generally, um, yeah, they poo while they're walking. That's uh, very common. You see them, their poo spread out, the dung. Uh, Kerry, uh, yes, you know, giraffe generally do find things to eat uh, all year round. Um, they're very good at uh, accessing especially the tops of the trees because of their, their long necks, which is what they've evolved. Um, and look at that. He, he pulls it off like almost like a lollipop. Grrk. Or what's that, like a, a milli. We call it a... Oh, look at that tongue. Oh, and he's taken the whole branch. He's like, you're getting a bit greedy. Yeah, and that one's, you know, he's taken takeaways. So that's a walkthrough. Yeah. Not a drive through, a walkthrough. Look at that black tongue. And for those that don't know or have never seen a giraffe's tongue before, it's very black, it's very long, um, and it's got a lot of melanin in it, if we get to see it again. I'm sure we will, the way this guy's feeding. See that? Yeah, because it spends a lot of time out in the hot African sun, because of the way that they feed. Look how he's taking it along like that. And so it would get sunburnt if they had a pink tongue. But look at him, he's just very dexterous, eh? Hey? With that tongue, look at that. <laughs> oh, he's going back for more. Yeah. So he's really stripping those leaves off, eh? And what is quite interesting, though, you won't generally see giraffe. <laughs> I think there's lots of people that are really enjoying uh, this sighting, and uh, and Louise is telling me that there's a, a couple of um, giraffe now at Voyatella Dam, which you can see on the dam cam. So he may be have a good idea to send him on over that way he can find himself a couple of girlfriends because giraffe also their sort of social structure is um, random really it's loose associations and so they don't really move in herds you can find them in groups sometimes but they don't you know settle on that they just move in and out and like I've said before I think they're pretty much the hippies of the of the bush it's uh, free love <laughs> well, he's also enjoying these leaves on this leadwood. 
rather tasty. Now, what I want to see is, let's watch, you could probably see him with the food ball coming up, the, uh, coming up his neck again, and he's getting a bit irritated with those ox pickers. Uh, no, he's feeding again. So well, once they've got a lot of leaves and they chew them, then you can actually stand and watch it. It's very apparent when they regurgitate that, that ball. There goes his tongue again. <laughs> yes, it's long, eh? It's a shame he's behind that branch, but... And the ox peckers hard at work. Now, Kenneth, very good question. Those aren't horns that he's, that he's got on the top of his head because that's bony extensions of the skull. So the horns on an antelope, the base of the horns of an antelope is basically like that. And then it's like nails growing on the top of it. So antelope do have that little base or ossicone, which is then covered by and held and anchored by the ossicones, but then the horn grows on top of that, much like your nails grow on the top of your finger. Um, the horns grow on top of the antelope's ossicones growing up from there. And now he's walking out in front of us. I wonder if he might be heading on down to Twin Dams and going for a drink. We might slowly follow him there and see if we get lucky because it's always very, very nice to watch giraffe drinking. And he is very pretty in this light. Still very windy at the moment. Louise telling me that there's five giraffe on the dam cam, everyone. So if you are a giraffe lover, get on to the dam cam right now. They are there. And I think we'll be heading on down to the waterhole and watch if this guy's going to go for a drink. I have to make our way slowly because they do startle easily, do the giraffe, especially next to a waterhole. We'll just go nice and slowly, and I'm, I'm sure that he's going to bide his time, as giraffe do. They can be very frustrating coming to the waterhole because they can sometimes take hours. And you know, every photographer always wants to get that shot of a giraffe as he's busy drinking. You can spend days trying to get that. Let's just move up here nice and slowly. All right, I'm going to try and get into a nice position to watch this giraffe. I'm pretty sure he's going to go for a drink. But um, let's head you on back over to Steve and see how the queen is. Hmm, the queen has disappeared into the drainage line. She looked like she was interested in some nyala. We heard a very funny sound. I then saw the nyala with my binoculars. They looked very okay. And then a hyena came out of nowhere behind us and has followed her down again. But look at this. Impossible to go in there. Very mysterious, Lou. But she showed a lot of interest. I thought we weren't sure if she killed something because there was this noise and then we like... And then I went and saw one Yala just sort of casually enjoying life. So we're hoping she's going to come out this way. So we've taken a, an instinctive sort of gander that she might pop out because going forward is not really an option. Or going back is the only real way. And hopefully she's going to come out of the drainage line. This is the area where uh, two mornings ago, Herbie and myself were up and down, up and down in this block. She was just moving from us, moving for us, and we're just getting tracks. This is exactly the habitat that leopards live for. This is where their food is. Nyalas, Dacre, uh, Impala, Franklins, all sorts of things living it up here. It's abundant, it's a smorgasbord, and because it's a little bit windy, those animals are sheltering inside, so she knows that. She's a very smart cat. She's been around many a year. Once again, everything's gone silent. We're just going to have a very, very deep listen as we stare into the thick bushes.
Okay, well, we're going to stay here for a little while longer and see if anything materializes. But it was marvelous to see Tundi, wasn't it? But in the meantime, Ralph is still busy with his very cool giraffe. Okay, now everyone, patience is the key because this might take a while. But while we wait, we can always watch him ruminate. Ooh, yes, I'm a poet and I don't even know it. I rhyme every time. That, that, British. Fergus. <laughs> it's going to take a while, but we can watch him ruminate. There we go, chewing the cud. And you're going to see him swallow shortly. And then it's going to go down his neck. And then literally like 10 seconds later, you're going to see it, that ball come back up his neck. Let's see if we can see it. Well, he's deciding whether he's going to come for a drink or not. Wait for the swallow. Okay, there it goes. Is it going to come back up? There it comes. Let's see him do it again. Uh, and the ox peck is sort of moving in the same motion as he's chewing. We could really put a dance beat to this. Let's wait for that. Yeah, and Louise saying we could turn this into a musical. Uh huh. Let's wait for it, wait for it. And the ox pick is playing along. Ah, giraffe doesn't want any of it. He's had enough. No more itchy and scratchy show. Oh, but they're back. They are persistent. Here we go. It's going to happen. But he might take three steps and stop again. Is it going to happen? Uh, and this guy's going straight in. He's still got a way to go. But it looks like he's made his mind up. I think we're in with a shot, yeah? Are we going to get the reflection? Now, which way is he going to drink? I think we should put a Twitter poll quickly because is he going to spread his legs or is he going to bend them in the front and literally put his head down over that? I'm going with, he's going to bend his legs in the front and not spread them. Okay, so Twitter poll up. Make your choice. Is he going to spread his legs to drink or is he going to bend them in the front and keep them together? Or option number three could also be he's not going to drink at all. No. Ah, he might use a straw, Fergus. <laughs> I think he's going to bend them. Is he going to spread them or is he going to bend them? <laughs> spread them or bend them? Yeah, no plastic straws though. That's bad for the environment. Got to use bamboo. Spread them or bend them? Spread them or bend them? What's he going to do? Come on, buddy. Yeah, he's waiting for the Twitter poll to finish before... Uh, okay, here we go. Are you going to bend him or spread him? <laughs> Look how he's looking at us. Okay, let's be quiet. Uh, looks like he might think... He's thinking about spreading him. Spread or bend, buddy? Uh... Oh, he's going for the spread. He's going for the spread, yes. Well, he's spreading and bending. <laughs> he went halfway in between. And they always do that little flick when they stand up. They always, when they finish the drink, they stand up almost as if to say, yeah, what? Okay, so so 78% of the Twitter poll said that he was going to spread his legs. Um, 
Now, I went with bending them, and I think we were all wrong because he did the half-spread bend. So he foxed us all. But he might go for another drink, so we might be in with another shot here while he's just making sure that his nostrils are clean. Okay, he wraps it around all the way. Imagine you could do that. That's incredible. I, I like what... Here we go. Is he going to go for another one? No. Nah. Look at that. It's like the buffalo as well when they stick their tongue into their nostrils. I find it quite amazing. He's obviously not too impressed. <laughs> they are comical. Here we go. Huh? Oopsie. What's happening there in the background? If if Impala are getting jittery, and Impala are getting jittery, they're going to mess up this giraffe drink here now. Just stay still in the background there, Impala. Let this guy have a drink. Come down here to the water hole, acting like a gentleman. All he wants is a drink. Now he's being watched. Here we go. The classic half spread bend. There comes the bend. He looks like a master at it. Really sucking that water up, eh? Classic. He looks like a thirsty old chap. An ox pick is really getting into the top of his ossicones there. <laughs> uh, back to cleaning his nostrils. He's really enjoying that drink. And I'm enjoying watching him. I hope you are too, because this is really, really cool. Watching those impala in the background as well. Sorry, buddy, you do have a peanut gallery here. What's those ox peckers on top? Really like sharpening their bow or something. Look at that. I don't think he's after any ticks. So, this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you, Mr. Giraffe. I'm going to sit here and see if he goes for another drink. But I hear that Taylor is busy with all sorts of arts and crafts. Oh, well, if you didn't know that I could do arts and crafts out here in the wilderness, well, you're horribly mistaken. Now, it's a very special day for my dear friend Tesla, all the way from the United States of America. And it is her birthday today, and I know that Tesla's favorite animal is a zebra. She always asks to see zebras. Sorry, Tesla, this is not part of the McCurdy Herdy, but it is a zebra especially for you. And I also didn't take art at school. As you can see, I've now managed to put paint all over myself. It's very windy out here, so I hope that you get to see this. Herbie, are you ready to sing? Okay. Yeah. Herbie and I, and Senzo. Senzo is going to, Senzo can sing. Like, he can sing really well. Senzo, you must do your deep opera. Happy birthday. Okay. A one, a two, a one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Herbie, sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tesla. Happy birthday to you. And the crowd goes wild! Yay! Now, Tesla, what I'm going to do... Are you ready? Last, last but not least. This is a disaster now because it's windy. Because I can't get this to you, because the post office is very slow, I think they're slow all over the world, I'm going to try and fly this to you. I still know how to make a paper aeroplane. Or maybe one day when you come visit me, if this doesn't give, get to you, I'll have to give you, make you another one in person, but we'll see. So keep an eye out. Maybe tomorrow morning. I think this airplane might take a day to get to you. So keep looking outside. Keep looking outside your window. And maybe you're not litter in the bush. Kirby, can I give you these to please hold for me? Santisana. We're ready. Now we've got to check which way is the wind blowing. As much as I'd love to fly it off in the sunset, that's not going to work. Are you ready? Tesla, you better keep an eye out for this. Hmm. Off it goes. And hopefully 
someday soon. <laughs> it didn't fly very well, hey, but maybe it'll get to you. Just maybe. <laughs> I'm apparently not very good at making aeroplanes either. But anyways, so I've just been sitting for the last little while on this termite mount because I thought, where am I going to find a flat surface? And we've been painting pictures, and I've somehow managed to get paint all over my face in the process. Like I said, it was windy. I did lose the paintbrush and the papers a few times um, towards me. So now I don't really know what we're going to do. What have you seen? Ah, very far away in, in the distance, there is some impala. Now, Senza, why are you showing everyone the impala? I'm just going to walk over here for two seconds. <laughs> some impala have come out to watch us. How cool is that? It's really nice, though. Yes, they are also come out to uh, celebrate your birthday. They're hiding behind that termite mound. I think they're using it as a sort of shield, uh, kind of, for, for the wind. It's not very nice all of a sudden. Well, that's good. It seems as though Tesla is not only us from Wild Earth wishing you a happy birthday, but the entire world, uh, well, the Twitterverse, is wishing you a happy birthday too. And there is a South African sunset as well. You're getting all the gifts today. I just wish that we had some zebras to show you. Maybe another day, maybe tomorrow morning. But well, isn't that stunning? That's kind of like a big candle, don't you think? It almost looks like the sky is on fire amongst the trees. Now, very, very cool. So there we go, Tesla. Happy birthday again. I hope you have a very, very special day. Hopefully you are watching this now. I look forward to hearing from your mom. Anyways, I'm not sure if Steve is still with Tandy or if she's given him the slip, but apparently he's now doing safari backwards. Happy birthday, Tesla. Oh, what a marvellous day. You've still got the whole day ahead of you. It is coming to the end of our day, but you still have the whole day to celebrate your birthday. And I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful day. Seeing as Taylor has already sung you happy birthday, I'm not going to because I don't sing very well. But have a beautiful, beautiful day. I don't have a paper aeroplane for you, but uh, what a marvellous gesture. So, I'm sorry, folks. Tandy has indeed given us the slip. Um, she's either still in there, very inaccessible area. She's definitely hungry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around again towards where the water is to the Gallego watering hole, see if maybe she's looped around. Because if she did wasn't successful there, then she'll go back for those impala that eluded her. But we got to see her. That was marvelous. <laughs> Apparently, I say marvelous a lot. We had a viewer in viewer visit this afternoon, and uh, she calls me marvelous Steve. This is marvelous Steve's marvelous thesaurus. Shall I put it here, Craigo? And there is a whole lot of words that I could use in place of marvelous. So, isn't that so sweet? I'm going to practice. Um, obviously, I haven't done very well this afternoon. Let me try a new one, shall I, Craigo? Splendid, sensational, remarkable. It's very nice words indeed. Very nice words. So this is the drainage that uh, is coming back to the road. I'm just going to line Craig up there. That she's kind of headed down, but where we were watching it was about a three, four meter drop, about 12 to 13, 14 feet in and I know we do have some special four-wheel drives here but there's no getting in there well we'd we'd probably get in and then the nose would, would bottom would land on our nose and then well we wouldn't get out um, Ralph would would call that getting stuck because you'd have to get someone to come pull you out and we'd probably break the car so you know as much as we'd like to show you Tundi again I don't think James or Stefan would be very happy with me breaking Wendy. She's a good girl, a little misunderstood sometimes. <laughs> okay, well, we're just hoping that she was still moving, Tundi that is, beautiful leopardess, and maybe she's just going to pop out.
laminated zinger. Yes, Project Alpha. But, I mean, she's such, she was such a lovely lady. She came up to me and she said, marvelous Steve. She shook my hand and she gave me that. She said she loves what we do. She's a very big fan. They come from Canada. Very big fan. And here's a bird that would very like, oh, it's a go-away bird. Sorry about the aerial. The go-away bird decided to go away. Oh, he's on this side now, Craig. Let me just go forward a touch and you'll get him behind the log. Or let me go back. That might be better. No, Lou, I am not going to do that. Oh, there he goes. Oh, marvellous. I can't help saying the word marvellous sometimes. Astounding. Spectacular. Enjoying himself a little dead piece of wood surveying the landscape maybe for one more gory berry before heading off to bed or did it spot Tundi walking past and has lost sight of her in the thickets it's hard to say but a beautiful beautiful bird Very characteristic bird of the savannas. <laughs> it is it's quite a nice thesaurus. I just need to practice it. I didn't realize how many times, obviously, I said the word marvelous. <laughs> James has suggested that we come up with some synonyms for certain words. Um, and I have taken that to heart, but sometimes in the moment, it just happens, I suppose. But very sweet, very sweet of her. Took a bit of effort to do that. And we had a viewer visit yesterday as well that I didn't see. Chris from Henshaw or Henshaw brought me a book. She brought me a book on the. I know I did a little a little segment a while ago on um, on the wolves of Yellowstone National Park and Christine came to visit with uh, Byron, Biceps Byron, you all know Byron, if you don't, you will, you will hear about Byron. She came to visit, I didn't see her, but she brought me a gift. She brought me a book with a little card and said, here, read more on, on the wolves of Yellowstone National Park, which I thought was very, very special. It's very thoughtful indeed, you know, fly all the way over here and give you presents with your names on and like well thought out stuff. I think that's excellent, excellent. Uh, sorry, Lou, I did not hear your comment. I was so deep in thought. Oh yes, indeed, Lisa. It is indeed things like that that make Wild Earth so special, Safari Live. There are some really beautiful people out there. Lots of you out there. We get to hear from every now and again. It's nice to meet people face to face, really, and to see how how happy they are to just be here, be out here. And they got to see Tundi. They were there with us just now. They got to see her. So it wasn't the longest of sightings. They didn't they didn't have our small little vehicle that can just nimble through. But well done again to the bushwalk team as always. Herbie the Leopard Whisperer, isn't he? Isn't he? Okay, well, I'm sure seeing as the sun is setting, the bushwalk team on their successful adventures will be on their way. So let's go say good night to them. Good night. No, I'm just joking. I'm still going to do one more segment. I can't wash the paint off of my face just yet either, so you'll have to just deal with me for a little while longer. Now, we've obviously, we see loads and loads of termite mounds, and we talk about them often and how important termites are to the ecosystem. But I suppose they're kind of like a little treasure chest, because not only do they hold delicious, tasty morsels in the form of termites for things like Aardwolf, which was seen a few nights ago in Coral, how exciting. And uh, and then also uh, aardvark, of course, eat them. Birds, a number of different creatures, even hyenas will eat the alates, will eat uh, the winged princes and princesses of the termites too. So, so it houses those. But obviously... 
in the winter months there's not much food around for instance say something like a squirrel or anything else that would, would store food so i suppose rodents as well but squirrels are very good at hiding their food and i think that termite mounds make the most amazing sort of stash spot so here's a little marula nut over here is that the actual nut what's that i think that has actually come from here I think they've tried to pull a piece of the nut out. Anyways, it didn't look like it was too successful. And I'm pretty sure if I were to shrink myself down to the size of a termite, which would be pretty epic, and went crawling around here, in some of these little little spots, maybe there's not really too many tunnels and things in here. You know, I'm pretty sure this is, some of this has all got to do with erosion and different creatures living in it. So maybe there was a tiny little tunnel, and then you can see how easy it is. Look just me doing that to excavate it look how much wider I'm making this tiny little hole so a lizard or something could come through there and they could utilize that little thing it's almost like a little cave if you will so squirrels will do the same thing and often if you go and look around termite mounds you can, I can pick up marula nuts all day long look at them they're all here some more these have all of course been located from their little hidey holes and the squirrel probably would have sat right up on this termite mound too and had a little snack as it warmed its body because we've been seeing squirrels doing that too feasting and then of course sitting up on on the mounds trying to get nice and warm so termite mounds are really really amazing and i think that this is actually a well-used entrance you can just see how smooth it is going down so i think there's been quite a few creatures living in here now leah this little mound that we're looking at at the moment this is only one third of the mound that we can actually see so if i stand sort of next to it I mean, that's going to give you a height sort of size. That's probably at my hip or so. Maybe not quite three feet, maybe just under three feet or so, somewhere around there. And um, this is, like I said, one third. So it's like an iceberg. So two thirds is actually below the surface of the earth. So, for instance, like that big mound that I found on Torchwood, Mount Torchwood, that's massive. I mean, that's a couple of meters high, a couple of meters wide. I can't even imagine how large it must be underneath the ground. And that's why I think it would be really cool to be shrunk down to the size of a termite. I don't know, do you take an army of people with you, though, to battle the soldiers? Because I don't think that they would like us in here. I'm just imagining having a, having to take some form of weaponry if I were to be shrunk down to fight off all the other insects and go and investigate. And I reckon you'd probably end up getting lost if you were the size of an ant or a termite all the way down in, in the tunnels below the surface of the earth. It is massive. Um, and I think it was an ant mound that they did it with in Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, where they actually filled the whole thing with cement. And they were absolutely astounded as to um, how big the network was below the, the surface of the earth. So most of the time when a termite mound develops, it starts underneath, or it does, they all start underneath the ground. And then only certain termite species actually build this sort of top mound. So this is from the large fungus growing termite, which is the most common species of termite that we sort of get here. And then you get others that inhabit trees. Some termites, like the harvested termites, that don't actually make a big top mound. They just live below the surface of the earth. And then they'll have big round holes going straight down into the ground. So it's quite cool, don't you think? I think termites are pretty amazing creatures, and yeah, I wish we could. I wish we could know everything about them. I'd like to have a conversation with a queen termite. Imagine the stories that she would have to tell. But anyways, from all of us here on the Bushwalk team, I hope you've enjoyed it. And Tesla again, just have a very, very happy birthday, and uh, I hope you have fun today shopping for all your goodies for your party on Saturday. I wish I could come. That would be nice. I've, if I could be invited. Um, I'll keep an eye out in the mail for an invitation. Anyways, from all of us here on the Bushwalk team, we'll see you all soon. But now, you're going to go to Ralph. Well, goodbye, Taylor. See you back at camp and salute. Well done on finding uh, the queen, Tandy, who we were looking for earlier. And maybe I'll get lucky and, and find her now that Steve's lost her. Um, but I'm not moving in exactly the same area. I've uh, come to the area where uh, there's always a chance that we can see Shudulu or Hukumuri. Um, but we'll just have to really be lucky in that sense. And once again, the sun has gone down, the sun has set. And so the night shift is about to begin. Which animals are going to start showing their faces? Well, it's going to be the owls and the little rodents that we always often see running across the road now at the moment and it wasn't far from here 
uh, when I was walking with Herbie yesterday that we saw a lot of owl tracks in fact along the road and it seems like they are um, uh, really attacking these small little mice that have uh, started to become really active um, in the evenings now so the owls really making the best of that and what else we could see genets and if we're really lucky an art fark uh, lions leopards hyenas any of those but generally we do you know mostly see the scrub hares and the bush babies very fleetingly jumping through the bushes not very often that we get to see one sitting still I had one not so long ago and I know that David has had a couple of them he's been really lucky Kenyan David now he's had some fantastic um, bush baby sightings of late what else could we see in the dark uh, jackals of course There's not too many around here civets civets yes absolutely we also saw their tracks yesterday I haven't seen uh, civet around here I saw one track white-tailed mongoose another nighttime critter walking around they're also very shy I did spot one the other night but it uh, ran off very quickly when you see civets at night they can be a little bit more relaxed but it's all dependent on the individual as well some of them are relaxed some of them not so um, we, we can also see hippos hippos out of the water um, elephants they never stop but uh, we'll only watch them with the, in, with the infrared or the night vision don't put any spots on them it's very similar with cheetah also we don't follow cheetah at night that's against the rules it's not uh, not ethical to follow a cheetah around with a spotlight at night so if you ever go on safari please remember what I'm saying to you if your ranger t starts spotting onto cheetah or any of the diurnal animals in particular please tell him to stop because um, that's not the thing we should be doing and it's um, it's during the day when you want to view those animals at night you view the nocturnal animals and leave the daytime animals alone unless you have the night vision like we have where you don't have to put a light onto them at all and you can see them in the dark well obviously with your night vision it's not so dark but you know what I mean but um, yeah so important those ethics need to remain and like owls and leopards up trees yes it's fine to shine a spot on them but you don't also put the spot straight in their eyes you try to bounce the light um, onto them as opposed to putting it straight into their face so that's the idea and drive around nice and slowly and listen Now, Andre, you're asking a very interesting question. If the crew were animals, what and who would they be? Well, Fergus, you're going to have to help me with this one. Let's start at the top. Let's go with James. What kind of an animal would James be? Uh, would he be something like an Inyala? He likes to prance a bit, doesn't he? Um, maybe an Inyala? Should we <laughs> go with that? A good singing voice, maybe. Um, a rutting, a rutting impala ram. Uh, Louise says because he he, li <laughs> he likes snorting a lot. I think you'll find that rather insulting. Oh, there we go. Speaking of rutting impalas. Hello, James. Hello, James. <laughs> 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 no, I think, come on, we've got to think a better one. Maybe something like a chorister robin that can sing and mime and do all sorts of different voices and it's quite small. Um, yeah, I'd go with the chorister robin. Let's go with that. A chorister robin uh, for James. So that's a little bird and you can look it up. That uh, that's, um, that's a bird that can mimic different bird calls very good singer you can sing all sorts of different things and also uh, quite colorful oh we've got a couple of Daker chasing each other right next Steve let's go with Steve what would Steve be 
Would he be a warthog? No, no. He's got a beard like a warthog. Doesn't have warts though. What else? What could Steve be? Come on, Ferg. What could Steve be? Steve could be... He's quite... Quite... Nah, but uh, come on, Louise, then you've got to give me some um, some alternatives. What do we got with Steve? Steve could be a... Um, yes, like, this is a tough question because, you know, you don't want to insult anybody. Um, and I, I think I might have already insulted Steve by mentioning War Dog. Oh, I'm sure they would have all sorts of funny names for me. Oh, Kia, uh, you say that Steve would be a tree. Which tree would he be? Which tree would he be? Would he be a bush? Or would he be a marula? Or a leadwood? Or a red bush willow? A fever tree? <laughs> now, I, I, would, I think because I've, I've seen him playing with lots of bush willow bark recently. So I would, I would go, let's, let's make Steve a red bush willow. There we go. So James is a chorister robin and Steve is a red bush willow. Right, Taylor. Taylor, I would say something like an ostrich. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, she hasn't got a long neck. Um, what should we make Taylor? Ostrich isn't loud enough, says Lou. Okay, so something that's quite loud. A ground hornbill? <laughs> oh, maybe a squirrel. There we, nah, nah. Okay, all right. So Taylor's a squirrel. What else? So who's next? Then it's David, Rafiki Dave. He'd have to be the, one of those monkeys from the, um, you know the one on Lion King? The Rafiki, the little Rafiki monkey on, on the Lion King. That, that suits David perfectly because he is Rafiki. He's Rafiki Dave. Um, okay, all right. Um, enough fun and games, everyone. That's really silly. You can think of what animal you can make me, and I don't get insulted that easily. So think away but um and i'm sure steve's got a name for me let's go over to him and see what it is ralph is the cross between a donkey and a giraffe that eats meat he's very tall he loves to run he's very thin and skinny and he eats a lot of meat so a carnivorous donkey horse giraffe I don't know. I went from a warthog to a red bush willow. I find it very strange. Very strange. <laughs> Some of you think Ralph is a water monitor. Well, yeah, I suppose. Long and lanky, I suppose that does work. If he does this with his tongue a lot. <laughs> what are you shouting at, birds? Yeah, no, he doesn't do that, thankfully, but we will let you know the moment he does. Reptilian Ralph. I like it. I like it. So, folks, we're trying to see if, um, if Tani's decided, after her attempted fa hunting, maybe she's come all the way back. This is kind of the, the area she would have walked back towards. I'm finding it very strange that she's going so far every night to do her m wanderings and leaving Columbus so far away. If you haven't seen the map, this is kind of the area that she's been. Craig, have you been there recently? Did you see her? So it's here somewhere, between here. That's where she's left Columba. And she comes all the way down. And this is where we've been playing around with her. So it's a very long way. But then she sort of moves along the, the Umulawati drainage system. This is where we had her tracks this morning. And then she comes back again. So she's almost as if she's trying to hunt Daika through the system all the way there. She misses a Daika and then comes back and tries again. And then who knows how many Daikas she's eating a night. But really, really interesting behavior how far she's moving. Maybe the, 
animals are a bit more spread out or maybe it's because she knows this area so well but then to be leaving her cub so far away just I don't know to me it doesn't make too much sense maybe she's giving a little bit of freedom you know a little bit more time on her own to contemplate while mommy's away I'm just going to look over towards this tree because we have a a raucous chorus of Aramark babblers. They call that allomimetic behavior, where a group of social birds calls in chorus. Some very similar scene at football and rugby matches when everyone cheers and chants together to to build sort of connectivity but they're a family and they do that as like an alliance as a gang so they're singing their, their hip-hop and their gangster songs and getting all sort of together and they do it all the time and it also keeps them together as they're moving through the trees they'll often follow the noises so that they can stay together strengthen numbers uh, helps with their feeding helps with their their grooming as well but also helps with defense of the territory and now it's getting to the night we don't only have the dawn chorus we have the evening chorus where they're re-establishing probably a territorial boundary between one group and the other group that's why it's so loud and chaotic Monique, yeah, Kukubara, but um, I think if you connected them all together, they got the same sort of loud noise. The Kukubara's got that one very loud, it's only one individual shouting and screaming, you know, very loud, but a very raucous cackling sound indeed. Marvellous. They are basically telling the others that we survived the day, now let's see if we can survive the night. That's when a lot of the danger happens. Birds will roost in the trees. Let's go and see how Reptilian Ralph is doing. I'm glad that Steve's taken it on the chin and he's laughing along with us. That's good to hear. <laughs> well, we're still looking for animals. And that's what we are doing. And we're having a laugh while we're doing it, but uh, why not? Why not? I'm coming down here towards Sandy Patch, which is right on the western side, in hopes that Shadulu makes an appearance, because I really would like to see her again. For me, she is really a beautiful female um, leopard. And, well, if Hukumuri would show up, that would also just make my day. But never know, coming down this side, we might also see the cheetah. And there we have a beautiful shot. Thanks for telling me, Ferg. I was too busy looking on the ground. Look at that shot of the mountain. And that is the Drakensberg mountain there in front of us with the beautiful colors now. And Lou saying Fergus is very romantic. Well, it is a perfect spot. All we need is a candle, Ferg. And that's very pretty. And the perfect spot for it. Look at that crepuscular light. And that is absolutely pretty. Yes. A little bit of cloud around, but it's cleared up from this morning because uh, there was a lot more and it was keeping us very chilled. Um, but like I've said, there's big storm that hit uh, Cape Town uh, last night into this morning. And that front, I'm sure, is going to move up the east coast and eventually hit us here in the low felt. It's just going to make the high felt, which is the Pretoria-Johannesburg area, very cold, probably sub-zero temperatures. And that's Celsius or centigrade, I'm talking. Uh, and it's, well, it's also going to be Fahrenheit, but uh, very, very cold, below freezing. 
And here we'll just probably get a bit of rain, also a bit of cooler weather. I don't know if, you know, it doesn't normally rain this time of year for us, but if that front comes all the way up the coast, it is going to. Um, so these clouds might gather a bit more. And you see that beautiful outline of the Drakensberg Mountains there? And some of the outlying little villages and towns, probably looking all the way up to Hutzbreit. And it is a very, very pretty indeed. Any of you viewers ever been to the Drakensberg? You do know that the Drakensberg was what J.R.R. Tolkien used as his um, inspiration to write Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Uh, he grew up at the foot, uh, at the foothills of the Drakensberg. Drakens, Draken is a, is a dragon, and Berg is mountains, so dragon mountains. That's where um, he got his um, inspiration. It's actually sad that they didn't um, film the actual movie in South Africa. That would have made it really um, sit nicely with the South Africans, but well, uh, the New Zealanders, I think it was shot in New Zealand, eh, hey, Ferg? I think so. Ah, so, but the mountains obviously a little bit bigger than ours that we have here. So, I think it uh, probably made it look a little bit better for, or a lot larger, should I say that. And they've got more hobbits, yes, that live in New Zealand. So, now, something also, now speaking of New Zealand, that just made me think of rugby because um, obviously we have a very big rivalry between South Africa and New Zealand and um, something happened over the weekend which was um, quite historical for South Africa. We had um, the first um, black South African rugby captain run out for the Springboks uh, at Ellis Park um, and it was very much a reminder of um, Nelson Mandela handing that um, World Cup trophy to Francois Pinar as uh, depicted in the movie Invictus um, and he also wore the number six on his back, did Nelson Mandela. And Sia Kulisi, who, was, who is now the Springbok captain, uh, well-deserved and absolutely brilliant man for the job, um, he is also number six. So it really um, reunited South Africa. And uh, we played England, um, and it was great that we also won that game. So, but, you know, just for the occasion of that, um, after, I think it's 127 years in Springbok history, that is the first black South African to lead the Springboks and unite the country. And I just thought it was an absolutely momentous occasion and it just reminded us all about that very um, famous 1995 World Cup victory against New Zealand. Um, this was only, well not only, a very good uh, opponent in, in uh, England um, and it was, a, it was an epic clash and we won 42-39. So it was absolutely fantastic. And I'm just going to continue on here a little bit further and in a moment we are also going to be switching over to infrared and I believe Steve has already done that. Yes, we have, Ralph, and uh, what an interesting topic Ralph brought up there. Ralph is an extremely passionate rugby supporter. I'm pretty passionate, but sure, Ralph is, he watches almost every game, if he can. Very, very passionate. And what he says about Sia Khaleesi leading the South African team out was almost as momentous as Nelson Mandela's long walk to freedom when he came out of jail those years ago. So it's a very, very big step in South African history. And we were very privileged to, to have watched that. Very, very privileged. And we beat the English that day as well, which was very good. Very, very good. Those of you out there who don't understand rugby, that's okay. It's a very, very good sport in South Africa and England and Australia and New Zealand. There's lots of rivalry between those four teams. Enormous, enormous rivalry. Enormous. 
We don't like losing to the English or the Australians. The All Blacks are always very good, so we don't mind losing to them. We don't like it, but uh, it's okay because we think they're a good side. But we hate losing to Australia and to England. So it was nice to beat them. The other day we beat them in the sevens rugby and the following day in the 15 rugby. So it was a double whammy. So I know we are talking all sorts of nonsense, but we are still in the search of all sorts of things. Ralph has gone west and I have gone east. Tony, that's a great question. Leopards can move in. It's really hard to say. I mean, it really depends on the size of the territories. Um, they generally move by night and uh, they could cover anywhere between five and maybe 20 kilometers if they needed to. Um, males and females obviously differently. Um, it depends if they're successful in whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, if they make a kill, they can obviously then they don't go very far. But if they've got a territorial boundary to cover, because like what the guys are saying is Tingana covers the entire eastern side of Jumi, goes all the way into Tortured, all the way into Bivalsuk in the north, all the way around into Simbambili and back again. So I don't know how far that is, but I mean, to tell you in all honesty, back in the day when I, when I was guiding in the Kruger, my trackers refused to follow le male leopard tracks. They said, no, no, we follow on the road until, because they just, they can cover such an enormous distance, such an enormous distance. So that's why when we have reports of Tingana on the dam cam at one o'clock last night, we kind of assume, unless he's lying down, that he's probably walked very far and Ralph tracked him up to the northern boundary and that was the end of Tingana. So he's possibly looped all the way back again and come in from the south. So it really is a mystery to me how far they can walk every single day. Very interesting really, very interesting. What a beautiful evening. I, th I think I saw or oh, heard Ralph has already shown you the Drakensberg Mountain. I'm not sure how that got him into rugby, but interesting how the mind wanders. Ah. Ah. I see. I see. I see. The, the, the connective tissue is coming back to me now. Friends of mine live down in a place down in the Eastern Cape called Hogsback, which uh, most of the little areas in there are named after Lord of the Rings things. And there's hundreds of waterfalls down there. It's a mystical forest. And that is one of the places, because Drakensberg actually forms part of that. Um, and that's one of the places where Tolkien spent a lot of his time. I did lots of drawings and things like that. Gave him a lot of inspiration. Okay, well, it seems like Ralph has got a feathered friend in the road. A feathered friend that flew away, as um, Murphy always states. And that's the way that it works. It was a little fiery neck night jar that was sitting on the road. I'll try and find another one, uh, hopefully, because uh, if you're with me and we spot it, it's much easier than trying to come across to me because these birds, it's always, as soon as we say, okay, we're coming across to you because we've got a bird, at that moment, the bird flies away. It happens so often, and I'm sure lots of the other guides slash presenters would tell you the same. It's very difficult on the birding front. But, um, yeah, so that's now heading full on into the darkness hours. And I'm very excited to know what is going to happen tonight and which animals are going to enter the property that we wake up tomorrow morning. I'm hoping that those male lions, I'm, I'm assuming it's the evoker males that were heard calling on the dam cam last night, um, make an appearance. They, it seems like they weren't too far off of the property. So I'm hoping that they come our way. I'd like for them to hang around a bit. And maybe the Nkuhumas return, that would be nice. What would you guys like to have return onto the property? Or what are you thinking would be nice for us to see in the morning? Because we never know what's going to happen in the bush.
Now, Zach, that's a good question you're asking. Now, what happens with lions? Um, you know, the females have the pride, they have their sort of territories that they establish and they don't um, normally cross over into different prides territories. But you can have coalition of male lions uh, in particular, normally it's coalitions, because single male lions, they can quite easily stay with one pride. But coalitions of males, obviously because there's more of them and there's more opportunity for them to, you know, they're stronger and there's, um, you know, they can move further distances uh, and, and, and um, dominate uh, more area. Um, uh, those coalitions of males can generally have more than one pride that they could, um, you know, uh, have as part of their territory. So, like the Birmingham boys, it seems like they were part of two, maybe three um, prides and, and, and would have mixed in with them. And now, obviously, I think with the Birminghams have, have headed away a little bit, maybe these evokers will take up a similar type role. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But, um, you know, it's quite interesting when they came in with those Unkahumas and obviously scattered them. And I hear, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that they have also killed uh, a couple of their cubs. Um, and, and that would have been as a result of them being um, uh, the Birmingham boys' cubs. So not their own cubs. So, they, you know, that's when they uh, practice uh, infanticide. They don't normally do it on their own cubs. It's generally only... Um, different males cubs and the reasoning behind it is is you know we, we've said it before I've said it many times as well but for anybody that doesn't know or is a new time viewer or whatever um, you know a male lion only has a very short period uh, of time in his prime you know he might he might only live for 10 years because it's a very uh, risky business being a male lion you've constantly got to fight your way through everything um, and uh, so you know they come into their prime at about four years old four sometimes five years old um, and they'll only be in their prime you know for four slash five years as well so they, they've only got that amount of time uh, to to pass on their genes so what happens is, is if they come into a pride that uh, already has cubs and from different males um, the, if they don't kill those cubs, it could take up to two years for those uh, females to be receptive and for them to pass on their own genes through those females. Um, so what they do is they'll immediately kill the cubs and within, it can be around about two months, the females will stop lactating and they could be receptive again. So it's just literally maximizing the time available to them to be able to pass on their genes. And they're not going to protect lions just for the sake of protecting lions. They want to pass on their own genes. So that's what it's all about and that's why infanticide does take place and that's why the, the males are not just um, being terrible individuals. They, they're thinking about their future um, and their genes. So it's, not, it's obviously an instinctive thing, but it's um, instinctively thinking about their future, if I can say that, and their evolutionary um, traits that uh, get passed on and survival of the fittest and natural selection, all of that mixed in, all rolled into one. Uh, quite interesting and a wonderful topic that infanticide and males coming in and doing that there's lots to talk about there um, I don't know if you talk about siblicide that's um, you know siblings or brothers and sisters or you know cubs uh, killing each other I don't know of that uh, happening in lions I don't I don't think it occurs um, there's, there's a debate about it in uh, hyena um, and I know that it does happen in in hyena. Um, it's not always uh, it, it's not always that it happens, but um, it does happen with hyena cubs, uh, especially when there's very low resources. Um, 
or because um, you know with um, hyenas if I'm not mistaken they only have two nipples for for drinking um, and so if there's three cubs it can happen that one of you know they're, they're very aggressive towards each other from birth and it can happen that with competition for food and for drinking of milk um, they can literally fight and and a strong the stronger one would kill the weaker one it's not that they eat uh, the other one but um, they can definitely kill them and if you look in eagles in some eagles you have the Cain and Abel effect uh, where you'll very often have that kind of sibler side but where one of the chicks will actually kill and eat its sibling and that does actually uh, perform quite a big function of them um, getting uh, uh, quite a lot of meat protein now we just spotted a birdie here a different birdie not the same one that we saw previously that other one was a fiery neck nightjar this is a spotted thickney as he runs through the grass there spotted thickney also a nocturnal animal nocturnal bird you can see them sometimes during the day but they're very inactive so it looks like he's just disappeared in there behind the branch so the night bumble continues and hopefully I'm gonna now maybe try and concentrate on trying to find a little chameleon but well let's head on over to Steve and see how his night drive is going well we found a bush baby it's just behind if you can go behind that branch the one on the left Craigo just on the left he's behind there just hiding away I can see him looking at me can you see him? Just on the branch at the back there. Lou can see the tail. Just at the back there. On that sort of angled branch. There he is at the bottom. There we go. Oh, hello. Did you see the jump? Oh, look how they run like kangaroos. <laughs> there we go. He's probably just woken up. Doing some, some up and down jumping jacks to warm up the small body. You know, that long tail helps in balance. You're looking at something on the floor. Might jump down. Oh, and he's busy eating something on the tree. A little bit of bark, perhaps. Bush babies, they like to suck the juices out of trees. Looks like it's drinking it, doesn't it? Possibly was doing that when we arrived and then just moved off and... Wait, look at that jump. They have got such good accuracy in their jumps and such marvellous feet to enable them to hold on to the branches. <laughs> this is so cool. They're able to, to chew with the side of their mouth. They've got these sharp teeth. They can actually gouge into the tree and then they can drink the sap that comes out of the tree. Like maple syrup. Mmm. Doesn't that sound my Ooh, there we go, he's coming back. Not finished yet. <laughs> Wait, look at that. How amazing is that? You see how far it jumped. Oh, it's gone very hard around the middle very hard to keep a track when it moves like that isn't that the most incredible springing motion oh, he's coming closer very inquisitive isn't it remember we are in 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 IR so we are not using any lights yeah, let's see what it's going to do is it going to gnaw at the tree <laughs> Monique, well, this the energy of this bush, there we go, it's going to nibble, get some of the juices out. If you want the energy of this bush, baby, you either have to eat uh, the sap of trees, or maybe it's the urinating on their hands that gives them the energy. Um, I'm guessing it's not the second one, but who knows? Who knows? Um, if anybody wants to try, um, I doubt it's going to work. Oh, look at how it's busy drinking the sap. Out of that looks like a knob thorn. Oh, 
how cool is that? I couldn't even tell you how far away it is because it's pitch black. But look how it's used its teeth. And then it's going to just sort of gouge it and then drink up any liquid that comes out. But is he listening? He has enormous ears. Incredible eyes. This is what nature, this is what it's all about being out here, folks. Be able to watch these animals behaving naturally in their natural environment. Whoop, where's he going to go? Whoops, look at that. Isn't that incredible? Oh, it's behind us now. Sorry about the aerial. I can't. It's gone. I jumped into that tree that you were on, Craigo. Well, how was that? That was spectacular. Sensational. Probably the best bush baby sighting I've had in the dock. And <laughs> fantastic. Well done, Craigo, for keeping up. Raj, no, bush babies are gallogos, and flying foxes, I believe, are a squirrel type rodent. Um, I think, anyway. Gallagos are actually more closely related to, to primates than they are to, to uh, rodents. So flying fox is just a squirrel that has evolved the ability to, to cover vast distances um, between tree canopies so as to obviously avoid predators. We have a bit of a hairy scene here, Craigo. We've got hairs all over the place, especially on the right of the car. Here's one. They're not as exciting as bush babies, I'm afraid, but every now and again they get up to some interesting antics. Let's see if we can get it talking about rodents. Very similar to a rodent, isn't it? The hair. Very long ears. Busy munching away. Very good little grazer. Will feed on forbs as well as um, grasses. And they come out at night to to forage on the grasses when there's less nocturnal predators in the form of eagles around. But they do still fall prey to large eagles like the giant or Varose eagle owl, which not far away from where we are right now. I saw one taking off with a squealing little hair in its talons once. And they also, like the bush baby, have just come out to play, come out to feed their nocturnal movements. Well, to our buck, that's a very good question. There's lots of debates about what animals can see and how do they see. And, um, you know, there's lots of thoughts behind raptors being able to see in, in sort of infrared t sort of frequencies, uh, even in ultraviolet. We know insects are almost exclusively ultraviolet in their vision. Um, and lots of kestrels. Kestrels, we've pro it's been proven that they can follow UV trails with regards to urine and they hover over the nests or the nesting sites of rodents that have recently, or shrews that have recently, oh, a bit of a foot licking. Is that your lucky foot, Mr. Hare? Keep it clean. Um, so definitely UV, but there must be some heat signature that these animals are able to see. It's hard to say. I mean, infrared, oh, we go. he's got a friend. It's very hairy on the corner here. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's hard for me to say, really, what animals can and cannot see. And there's, I'm sure there's lots of literature out there. But how do you prove it, you know? How, how do these things go around? Um, infrared is not exactly looking at heat, is it, though? So I'm kind of talking myself into, into a corner here. Craig, what, how do you describe infrared, then? It's just that spectrum, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a very low low frequency, the opposite side to the UV. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, so it's the opposite side. Um, so I'm sure lots of animals probably have potential to see it. It's, how do they see at night? You know, they, they absorb enormous amounts of light in their eye. Um, all these nocturnal animals give up color to be able to see in a black and white sort of spectrum, the way we're looking at now. 
Now that's what the rod cells see in your nocturnal animals. And um, so giving up color gives them probably a far better sight at night. And potentially it is at a spectrum of what we're looking at right now. Because, I mean, you can... You see these animals moving around in the pitch blackness, and to them, this is probably what they see. It's hard to know, though, because I've never sat down a group of hares and asked them to fill out a questionnaire on what they see exactly when the lights go out. But we can assume, you know, you watch leopards and lions hunt in pitch dark darkness, and they just get on with it, really. And we can follow them with these lights, and basically, we have, we've assumed that they're seeing at a very similar sort of level. Here we go, he's munching away at his grass. Okay, well, we're going to move on from our hares, and uh, we're going to slowly start making our way back to camp. And from myself and Craig, it's been a marvellous evening. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks, Steve. And wow, that sounds like that was an awesome bush baby uh, sighting that you guys had. As I said earlier, it's not often that you get to see them nice and close and, and hanging around and even feeding on the sap. I love to watch them doing that. That is awesome. I'm very happy that's happened again. Wow. So the bush babies, maybe they're getting habituated to us. Maybe they're calming down. But I'm not gonna put any money on them hanging around for me I've already had one lucky day with them or evening not too many others have hung around now Mafuta thanks for your comment you say you look at the Drakensberg every day well that's nice I wonder where you live where do you live? Do you live around here or do you live, um, do, are you South African? I know that mafuta is a South African word, um, but uh, just wondering where you live. If you look at the Drakensberg every day or do you do it online or how do you do it? Uh, there's, aha, uh -huh. so Lou says she thinks that uh, mafuta is from Limpopo somewhere, but I think it's just taking a guess. But um, that's wonderful, yeah, because, hey, guys, I mean, the, the Drakensberg is a beautiful mountain range, as is a lot of places in South Africa, and we like to say that... <clears throat> now, Crocket, you say that you've hiked in it before. Um, yeah, there's the Royal Natal National Park, um, and you can also go across into Lesotho, which is uh, another country altogether. Um, and you've got some of the highest waterfalls in the world as well uh, emanating from the Drakensberg. As we start now heading down back towards camp, we are heading towards the end of the show, everyone. So I'm just stopping because I would like to face you and say thank you very much once again for watching Safari Live. It's been an absolute fantastic day. Please join us again tomorrow, and I'm going to sign out. Good night, goodbye, and see you later.